You know, the Chinese philosopher Wei Po Yang said, uh, worry is preposterous. And I think that's true. Uh, we don't know enough to worry. Are there questions uh, from last night? I wanted to know um, what uh, the the continuity between what you were saying at the beginning about um, changing the way we are in relationship to the earth and consuming less resources, and then what you were saying toward the end about um, the coming of the millennium and moving out of the birth canal into a new reality. Yeah. Right. No, I think that there is, a, a, if not a contradiction there, at least uh, uh, it's some kind of uh, coincidence of opposites. I, what I don't want to say is that there's nothing to be done, that there is no moral or political imperative and that we can just continue with this mindless potlatch civilization until everything is ruined because I don't think, I don't believe that and I think it's socially irresponsible to say that. On the other hand, I, what I don't want to fall too much in the other direction toward is saying that it all depends on us and that we must raise enormous levels of anxiety in ourselves and uh, act as though the salvation of the planet depended on us. It, what more is happening is that the most important political work that needs to be done is for each of us to raise our own consciousness about these issues and then uh, to create a community based on the sum total of our personal acts of reformation. So, you know, it is very important to uh, uh, bring help to people in the third world who are struggling to raise families and preserve their environments and this sort of thing. But if I were a rationalist, I would be completely despairing. So we are more in the role of like midwives of this new order. It, and I guess it's useful then to return to that birth metaphor. The birth of the new humanity and the new earth is going to happen. But in the same way that a midwife or, or an obstetrician can ease a birth, make it smoother, make it less painful for all concerned, that's the role that political activism needs to take. So I think we should uh, act as though the salvation of the earth is on our shoulders but feel as though it is an automatic unfolding that we need not uh, have anxiety about. You know, the Chinese philosopher Wei Po Yang said, uh, worry is preposterous. And I think that's true. Uh, we don't know enough to worry. And to, to worry is in a sense a kind of act of hubris because you are claiming complete knowledge of the situation and then you worry. And so what is much more empowering and what makes the, the process of historical ending easier, I think, is to act from your heart and to individual acts of caring are more important than grandiose than giving your energy to grandiose political schemes. I mean, it almost comes back down to the, to the gospel admonition to, you know, heal the sick, clothe the naked, visit the imprisoned, bury the dead. But there's nothing there about grandiose political reform and all that sort of thing. That, I think, arises out of the zeitgeist of the collectivity. And I'm very hopeful. Uh, people have a sort of hear my rap differently. I mean, I've had people after what I thought were 
inspiring panegyrics come up to me and say, but it's such a dark and horrifying vision. It means that I failed as a communicator in that situation because I'm the gonest and most irrational hope freak I've ever met. I mean, I think everything is fine. Everything is going toward the purpose for which it was intended, but it's an act of conscious awareness on the part of each of us that carries us toward that. So, you know, often in what I say, there is, if not the fact of contradiction, then the appearance of contradiction. This is because, to my mind, life is complicated enough to admit of contradiction. Was it Oscar Wilde or who was it who said, I contradict myself? I contradict myself. <laughs> um, logical consistency is one of the, the prejudices that we've inherited from the scientific attempt to describe the world. But in fact, even science at its basic level has now abandoned that as an ideal. In quantum physics, the way it's done mathematically is you have an ordinary causal logic, uh, an if-then logic, but in order to handle what quantum physics is attempting to describe, you also have to have what are called islands of Boole or islands of Boolean logic which is embedded in the standard logic and which is a logic of both and. And you cannot reduce this to a non-contradictory description. The great thing about the rational program of science is pushed far enough, it reveals the irrational foundations of nature. And that's really what the crisis in science now is. The, the, cutting edges of physical science have contacted the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in the 20s, the anthropocentric principle in the, in the 80s and 70s, and uh, we are realizing that somehow the notion of an observer outside the system with a godlike objectivity and uh, zero input into the situation that was a necessary fiction for the more naive program of description of nature. But as we move into the more sophisticated description of nature, we have to place the observer in the picture and then there is going to be a, a reverberation of contradiction that is uh, uh, probably can't be gotten rid of. I mentioned a little, or I referred to this in the talk last night, where I said we shouldn't push for closure. We should accept that it is in principle mysterious. And so we are never explaining life or relationships or economies or whatever we're looking at. We're describing them with ever more prescient accuracy. But, but we cannot uh, eliminate the unknown. One of my teachers years ago, West Churchman, wrote a wonderful book called Planning on Uncertainty. And I think, you know, we all need to plan on uncertainty and it's the one thing that is left out of most models because the model builder has such faith in the model that he would never build in a trapdoor into the realm of uncertainty. And yet life is composed almost entirely of these kinds of trapdoors, you see. Does that do it? So, do I understand then that um, in, in your vision, um, we really don't know anything about what it's going to look like once we're out of the birth canal, but what we can do now is behave with integrity toward the world that we're in today. Is that right? That's right. And it's not that in principle we can't know what it's like out beyond the birth canal. It's simply that it's too early. I used the metaphor last night of that the transcendental object is below the event horizon. It is, 
And so all we can see is the rosy glow of its promise at this point. But give us ten years and the actual edge of the transcendental object will rise above the event horizon. I mean, I don't think that we are marginalized or uh, part of fad and fashion. I think this is actually the rising modality necessary for the future if we're going to make it through. In other words, I suspect that 10 years from now, 15 years from now, the things we are talking about today will be the general metaphors and concerns in society because I'm, I just have a very strong intuition based on, you know, uh, a lot of journeying into those hyperspatial modalities that uh, this is the path. And I'm sufficiently convinced of that to submit it to a kind of intellectual plebiscite. I mean, I believe that ideas compete with each other the way animals compete in an environment and that the best ideas, the most fitting ideas for the human adventure will, will uh, eliminate their competition. And that's what we're experiencing now in, in the political domain, is the competition between uh, ideological systems roughly comparable to dinosaurs and mammals. And, you know, you can decide which is which, but the two are incommensurate and, and one is in the act of eliminating the other. And so it's a matter of uh, observing this process, understanding it, and being comfortable with it. If you're right, I don't think you need to feel any urgency because uh, that will quite naturally percolate out uh, in the mix. Many of you have heard me quote William Blake. It's always worth repeating. He said, if the truth can be told so as to be understood, it will be believed. In other words, understanding compels belief. You don't have to hammer on somebody. Your task is to refine your message into an understandable form and then let the dynamics of intellectual competition decide uh, what is the best model to, to follow. Yeah. Uh, I had a question related to what you were just saying and then I had a chemistry question. Uh, what keeps me optimistic is that information seems to be spreading more rapidly and some futurists have said that by the year 2011 that information will be doubling every second. I was wondering if you could comment on that. Well, yeah. I mean, I uh, part of what I was going to talk about last night and get, didn't get to is uh, I'm the purveyor of a very formal mathematical theory about how history unfolds itself and what time is. And to your great good fortune, you're not going to be exposed to this today. Had we two days, I would uh, 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 flay you with it on the second day. But here's the thing that's going on. Since the very first moments of the universe's existence, uh, novelty, as I call it, or complexity, as someone else has called it, or connectedness, has been increasing. So that the, the early universe was very simple. It was a, a plasma of free electrons. There were no laws of molecular physics, still less laws of, uh, of biology or gene segregation or something like that. As the universe has aged, it has become more and more complex. We represent the culmination to the present moment of that process. Well, I don't think that's particularly big news. It's sort of a stating of the obvious that the universe has grown more complex through time. But what is interesting 
is that each advancement into complexity that has built on the previously established foundation of complexity occurs more rapidly than the stages which preceded it. So if you were to draw a diagram of that, it would be an involuting spiral. So that after the Big Bang and, it's, and things settle down after the first few nanoseconds of the universe's existence, well then for a long time it was very boring. And all that happened was the temperatures fell very gradually. Eventually they fell to the point where uh, atoms could settle down into stable orbits around nuclei. And then, as it fell, as the temperature fell still further, eventually these atoms could aggregate into molecular structures. Again, each advancement into novelty proceeding more rapidly than the stage which preceded it. Well, that's why, to my mind, human history is not a radical break with primate biology. It simply represents an acceleration of primate behavior into a more compacted temporal domain. And uh, high technology, electronic data transfer, the erection of global society, which has built on the previous levels of cultural attainment has happened even more quickly. So that these eras or epochs, you could almost think of them as, of complexity are now of such short duration that instead of taking millions of years or perhaps billions of years to, to transit through one of these, we now are moving through them at the rate of a, uh, one or two a decade and beyond that one or two every two or three years and beyond that one or two every few months and I see no elegant reason for assuming that this process will ever cease its asymptotic acceleration well then if you picture what I'm describing it's a funnel of some sort which begins with an extremely wide mouth but which has now narrowed to an extremely um, small and fast moving kind of situation and this is why history is a self-limiting process it isn't that we have broken away from the the uh, slow moving processes of ordinary nature. It's that we represent nature at a different time frame. And I think this is why history is ending, because it's going so much faster than it used to go that it's going to finish very soon. There may be as much experience ahead of us as there is behind us, but we're moving through it so much faster than we used to that we may we are literally approaching the end of time at a faster and faster speed and uh, this is something built into the structure of the cosmos it's the answer to the question where did we come from we were called forth out of biological organization by the continued acceleration of the expression of novelty and and this is why I count myself as a proponent of what I call the big surprise rather than the big bang the big surprise lies ahead of us not billions of years or millions of years or thousands of years in the future but within our lifetimes potentially uh, and it's interesting the I think I said this last night, the people who run the world now possess curves which when they draw these curves and try to extrapolate them 50 years into the future, it makes no sense at all. You cannot extrapolate uh, the ozone hole 
the AIDS epidemic, the pl spread of plutonium. You cannot extrapolate these things a hundred years into the future because they all go asymptotic and reach infinity. So it means the oceans boil, the atmosphere blows off, everybody dies and that's the end of it. But I don't think that's what's happening. I think novelty is the saving grace and that we are, the historical adventure is essentially coming into the finale of the third act and it is our great good fortune to be spectators and participants in the phenomena that for all preceding generations could only be anticipated uh, and, uh, and prayed for. It's a screwy position, I understand. I mean, boiled down to a bumper sticker, it's a bearded guy on the corner with a sign which says, repent for the end is nigh, or maybe just the end is nigh. But I think all the evidence is that uh, the soul is about to collectively leave the body. The human imagination married to technology has become a force too powerful to be unleashed within the fragile ecosystem of this planet. So we must either carry ourselves elsewhere or the planet's homeostatic drive to preserve ordinary biology will eliminate us through epidemic disease or climatological upheaval or, you know, the, there are many possibilities. So I think we are being propelled somewhat reluctantly into a new human modality that is as radical a shift as birth is to the individual or as the original entry into history was for our species. History cannot be conceived of as preceding another thousand or ten thousand years. I mean, it, it just can't be. So it must be that it's a self-limiting process. And it only lasts twenty-five thousand years. I mean, if you go back 25,000 years, the Earth was in ecodynamic balance. Human beings were fully established as intelligent, as caring, as creative as you and I. Uh, theater, poetry, dance, love, hope, tragedy, religion, all these things were in place. But history represents uh, Gaia hitting the fast forward button on the evolution of the primates and it, it seems of long duration to us because we, at the level of the expression of the individual phenotype, are as ephemeral as mayflies. You know, a person lives 70 years, 90 years, and then they're gone. But on a scale of, of 25,000 years, Clearly what is happening on this planet is the emergence of an entirely new kind of order within the natural order. It is natural, but it is new. There is no contradiction in this. Once atoms were a new invention, once molecules were a new invention, once polymers were the cutting edge of what's happening, now the cutting edge of what's happening is large-scale primate machine integrated societies based on the movement of information. Did that do it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you want to follow on? No, quick question. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, is 5-methyl-oxy-NN-dimethyltryptamine crystalline legal to possess and would one if one was going to mix it, would one mix it with harming, harmelo, uh, heroline, or heroline, or harmaline? <laughs> that was a word salad. Um, well, I think you're asking about 5-MeO-DMT, 5-methoxy-dimethyltryptamine, the toad foam of recent fame. Uh, as far as I understand, I think that it's legal. However, it would probably depend on the length of the fangs of the local DA because there is what's called the Cogener Law, 
which says that structural near relatives of hallucinogens can also be prosecuted as illegal compounds. As far as the question about the harmine alkaloids, harmine, harmaline, tetrahydroharman, harmelo, I think is apocryphal, uh, specious. The, but the notion which must lie behind your question is harmine alkaloids inhibit monoamine oxidase, which is an enzyme system in the human gut that tends to inactivate um, amines, monoamines, of which these hallucinogens all, most all fall into that category. Uh, you could attempt to inhibit your MAO with a harmine, with a dose of harmine or harmaline, and then smoke 5-MeO DMT. But I, I don't recommend this unless you are a pharmacologist with hours and hours of psychedelic flight time on your log. And this is certainly nothing for the ingenue to attempt. Once you, once you get out into the realm of synergies, that means what happens when you run two metabolically active compounds at the same time, and some people do three and four and five, you know, you're definitely on your own because <laughs> pharmacology doesn't study drugs like that. They study them in isolation, their activity. And, you know, some people say of the smokable tryptamines, they're so quick that wouldn't it be logical to inhibit your MAO in order to freeze frame the experience and instead of having it last three minutes, have it last 30 minutes. Yes, that's a fine idea, but what if it lasted 30 hours instead? I mean, you, you don't, you know, a miss is as good as a mile in this game, so you should be, have your mantras ready if you <laughs> push off uh, into that. Yeah. Quick and easy question. Okay, I imagine psilocybin is probably, you know, pretty common in pretty common use, and I'm sure that people around here are pretty aware of the malathion spraying that's going on. And I've always been curious. Uh, I'm not a chemistry student, but since psilocybin does have a phosphorus in it, and I know most of the of malathion and most of the other chemicals like it are organophosphates, and they react synergistically. Is there a possibility of a synergistic toxicity when you get, you know, a, a dose of malathion and you're using psilocybin? Well, every once in a while these kinds of questions come along and the answer is always since research with psilocybin is illegal or, and even in rats, counterproductive to your career, uh, <laughs> Nobody knows. Uh, you mentioned the phosphorus group in psilocybin. Psilocybin is 4-phosphoryloxy and in dimethyltryptamine. This is very interesting to me because, uh, and we don't have to spend too much time on this, but, but it's the only 4-substituted indole in nature on this planet. The only 4-substituted indole in nature on this planet. Well. This is suggestive to me of a possible extraterrestrial origin for this molecule because the way evolution works is from one structure <clears throat> you elaborate another structure and then near cousins of that appear and so forth and so on. The, the phosphorus group in the four position on psilocybin sticks out like a sore thumb uh, when you look at the structure of organic nature. much that malathion is a phosphorylated compound. Um, I was interesting, I noticed in Hoffer and Osmond's hallucinogens, malathion is occasionally, there are known cases of human abuse of malathion. And, and is, is there a bigger debt to pay at the dose where it does that? 
In other I, words, I don't know. I, I, you know, not not by the aerial spraying, but accidentally working with it. You know, and fairly concentrated. Uh, I've gotten it on my skin, and for several days I had very disturbed dreams and you know, broken sleep. And I think that that's it's pretty well reported that that's not uncommon at all. Well, that's very interesting uh, because it's a neurotoxin. It also creates a neural disturbance. You know, I'm willing to to buy into the notion that all drugs are poisons at certain doses. All substances are poisons at certain doses. I mean, you can kill yourself with common salt if you eat three pounds of it. That's all she wrote for you. So uh, always, what you're doing is you're perturbing the dynamic of ordinary functioning and then you want to and then what you're watching is the is the chemical cascade that returns you to equilibrium mm -hmm. is, uh, a psychedelic, a psychedelic type of compound used in many cultures but never really with much pleasure I don't think um, many cultures actually would posit that uh, Jimson weed for instance is, a, is an enjoyable high so it may give you a psychedelic experiences that make you vivid dreams, but it's not um, something that many people would volunteer to take, drugs of that type. Yeah, well that's something worth talking about, and certainly I found it true. The notion of intoxication is an incredibly uh, culture-bound idea, and what one culture considers an acceptable intoxication another culture just regards as an incredibly unpleasant experience. Uh, alcohol in high doses is not something most rational people would care to repeat, I think, unless there were cultural conditioning pushing you toward that, or tobacco. I mean, essentially that's an experience of toxicity. And until you build up uh, uh, tolerance to the more toxic aspects of tobacco. Every time you smoke it, you turn green and become nauseated. We had the experience in the Amazon, there was, for years, my brother and I pursued a hallucinogen called ukuhe that was uh, in use in a very restricted area by three tribes of Indians and the reason we were interested in it is because the ethnographic literature said that the shamans used it to talk to little men and because we had encountered in the DMT flash these things that I've called self-transforming machine elves we were interested in an aboriginal hallucinogen that would let you talk to little people of some sort and the chemistry of these things was known uh, of the ukuhe gradually became known in the 70s and it was made from the resin of a certain tree which elaborated not only DMT which is a clean fast-acting psychedelic tryptamine but also a number of other tryptamines and you know after immense expense and physical wear and tear we, on the upper Yaguas Yasu drainage in Peru, we actually contacted people who knew how to make this hallucinogen. And, you know, we thought it was going to hurl open the doorway to the golden realm. And when we finally got to the bioassay of it, which is a, a term which means getting loaded on it, um, <laughs> it was really tough to take this stuff. And, you know, your heart felt like it was just going to hammer its way out of your chest. And there were sweats. And, and there was hallucination. But my God, you were monitoring so many other physiological systems going into crisis that, uh, uh, you know, it seemed uh, almost ancillary. So then, you know, live through it the next morning troop down to the shaman's hut and say you know listen Basilia we, we have to talk and uh, and then him saying well yeah it takes getting used to and you know that's 
that's why our shamans don't live very long. <laughs> and, and so then you, you realize, aha, uh -huh, what we're dealing with here is a culture that has sanctioned this experience and projected a lot of cultural baggage onto it, but that if you're the unsold customer, you say, you know, I, I think once is enough. Thank you for that. A more familiar case that I think is similar, although some people rise up in holy wrath and we get into great arguments about this, but my personal opinion is that Amanita muscaria, do you all know what that is? It's the red mushroom uh, of European folk mythology in German. It's called the Fliegenpilz. It's, uh, it's atropinic too. Well, a lot of people who never got loaded on it spewed a lot of scholarly argument about how this was a wonderful shamanic intoxicant. But I submit to you in most cases it comes closer to being an ordeal. And it, it may be that because of genetic variation, seasonal variation, individual variations in the expression of its genome, edaphic factors, meaning the soil that it grows in, uh, the nature of its mycorrhizal relationship, and in other words, we've staked out here about an eight variable equation relative to Amanita muscaria, that sometimes it's wonderful. But unless you have always been in that area and can draw on the shamanic lore of great tradition about it, I think just going out into the woods and faunching down on the first Amanita muscaria that you come upon is probably a ticket to the emergency room uh, if, you're, if you're not very careful. Uh, in Madagascar, there are no uh, hallucinogens as we would understand it, but there are what are called um, ordeal poisons. This is an entire category in Madagascan Aboriginal shamanism. What's going on here, uh, there, is there are these plants which the, you take them and you at first assume you're going to die because you feel so bad. And then you feel so bad that you beg to die. <laughs> and then you don't die and you recover completely within 10 to 12 hours. And you are so damn glad to be alive that this has all the characteristics of a psychedelic experience. I mean, you come down a kinder, gentler, more attentive, more decent human being, but it's only because you've been hurled into the jaws of death itself and then brought back. That will work, folks. But so my, my interest has always been to, to squeeze the definition of psychedelic, to narrow it, to make it more precise. I mean, sometimes people say, well, you're, you're, it's about altered states. Well, there are all kinds of altered states, thousands of altered states, without even talking about drugs. We can talk about uh, uh, being in love, being abandoned in love, uh, being jealous, being anxious about your financial situation, uh, suddenly seeing the, your roots in high Atlantis. These are all altered states. None of them are psychedelic. Well, then you move into the realm of drugs. There are, as you mentioned, atropine states propane-induced de, uh, uh, deliriums, the uh, uh, ketamine-type states, states on the edge of anesthesia, states of extraordinary agitation brought on by uh, the whole amphetamine family. All of these things are altered states, pharmacologically achieved, and to my mind, they are not truly psychedelic. What psychedelic means to me is, in structural terms, a very small number of compounds all based on, uh, on uh, indole. The indole hallucinogens are the true psychedelics. And let's see, what are they? There aren't that many. 
Uh, there's LSD, which is a, a semi-synthetic, made in the laboratory, but from organic precursors, usually. LSD, uh, ibogaine, about which not much is known because it has never achieved much currency in the underground in this country. Psilocybin, DMT, um, and the beta carboline which are monoamine oxidase inhibitors, but only hallucinogens at close to the toxic dose. And that's it. Peyote, peyote is, an interesting, uh, is an interesting edge situation because mescaline is not an indole. It's an amphetamine. And if you look at the, the chemical, the pharmacological profile on peyote, it's uh, different from all these others. First of all, an effective dose of mescaline is, according to the, to the literature, 700 milligrams. That's a, a pile of white powder in the palm of your hand. In other words, it's, it's, a, it's a, an inefficient drug. It puts a lot of strain on your system. There are different ways to think about toxicity. One way is to ask, how much of this compound do you have to take to experience an effect? If you have to take 700 milligrams, then it's a pretty crude uh, drug because that's a lot. On the other hand, you know, LSD is at the other end of the spectrum. Uh, you can feel quite strongly 50 gamma, 50 micrograms of LSD. Uh, Help me out here. What is that? Five ten thousandths of a gram is 50 gamma. That is, to a pharmacologist, the fact that a human being can feel 50 micrograms of a compound is like a miracle. I mean, to give you an analogy so you can understand that, that's like having one red ant tear down the Empire State Building in 30 minutes. I mean, that's... That's what it looks like when 50 gamma of LSD enter your body. So, so LSD has a, an incredibly low toxicity by that measure, you see. Well, then psilocybin falls in the mid-range. Uh, it, it requires a, about 15 to 25 milligrams. And, uh, and this is an acceptable uh, situation. The other way of talking about psychedelics, rather than structurally or in terms of dose-dependent profile, is it's a specific altered state. It is, first of all, I like the word hallucinogen or hallucinogen. See, I grew up in a cattle town in Colorado and I haven't shed quite all of it, but hallucinogens because I was always fascinated by the idea of hallucination. The, to me, for some reason, the idea of seeing something which is not there just became the holy grail for me because that was so challenging to my notion of what is possible. And uh, so then when we lay these indole psychedelics out in front of us and are trying to make decisions, uh, uh, many people have a great enthusiasm for LSD because it empowers thought and stirs the engines of cognition. But it only reluctantly, compared to these other things, is a strong visionary hallucinogen. You usually have to synergize it with cannabis or mescaline. And then those combinations are highly visionary. What I love about psilocybin is that it causes you to hallucinate so effortlessly at relatively low doses and without a lot of uh, accompanying, uh, you know, sweating or tremoring or physical discomfort. And DMT is even more powerful as uh, an inducer of visionary states. Now, people who have never had a hallucination, and if you read the literature, think that a hallucination means little traveling lights or colored lines or the kinds of things you see when you press on your closed eyelids. 
Th those are not what I'm talking about. That kind of thing is called hypnagogia. Hypnagogia also includes chorus lines of dancing mice, little round candies, falling leaves, snowflakes. In other words, the flotsam and jetsam of the mental ocean, which is generally no more interesting than the flotsam and jetsam uh, of, of uh, the oceans of three space. What I'm interested in are full field, 360 degree visionary scenarios of jungles, deserts, ice fields, ruined cities, machine scapes, and a whole bunch of other stuff which is not so easily dropped into any category of experience that we're familiar with, but highly organized, three-dimensional, self-sustaining, transformed modalities that you cannot pour language over. I mean, when you try to say what it is, all you can say is what it isn't. And I find that tremendously affirming because to me, and I guess this is important to me, that is the experience which proves that this is not self-generated. When I <clears throat> take a plant and it shows me something I could previously not have imagined, then I know I am in the presence of the other because it couldn't have come out of me. I mean, if you insist, that the volleys, that the Niagara of hallucination caused by psilocybin is generated out of the dynamics of your own psyche. If you insist that that's true, then you are unable to explain what your own psyche is. In other words, you become unrecognizable to yourself in that case. And if you are unrecognizable to yourself, you are not yourself in some sense. So I prefer to believe that it's coming from the outside, that mind is a field into which we dip the dipstick of observation, but it's not being generated in the neurons of the brain. Yeah, this guy's been waiting patiently, or perhaps impatiently. <laughs> I haven't heard much about uh, since the uh, late 60s, and I think the FDA took it out of the marketplace. Uh, it was the Hawaiian wood rose. Well, Do you know anything about that? Sure, yes. Um, Hawaiian wood rose, Argeria nervosa. The Argeria refers to the, the silvery hairs on the underside of the leaves. It turns out that in the higher plants, you see, LSD or its near relatives occur in ergot and are made from ergot. It doesn't occur in ergot, but it's made from ergot. Ergot is a fungi, an entirely different order of life than higher plants. But in the higher plants, uh, in the convolvulaceae, the morning glory family, there are a number of different genera that contain alkaloids that are milligram effective cousins of LSD. And Argeria nervosa is the best known of these. Uh, it's also probably, I would estimate, gram for gram, probably the most concentrated natural hallucinogen on this planet. Because half a teaspoon is an effective dose. Where people get in trouble with baby Hawaiian woodrows is they think, oh well, it's a plant and plants are always weak, so let's do uh, half a cup or something like that. And then, you know, you're begging for mercy in a hurry. Uh, there are 13 species of Argeria, all natives of Asia, uh, distributed from the base of the Himalayas to western Polynesia and Argeria nervosa is simply the best known. Now, the problem with it is that, and this is something you always have to be aware of with, with plant hallucinogens, is um, that uh, cardioactive compounds occur in Argeria as well. And so if you misdose even slightly, it will put your heart through changes that will stand your hair on end and I've never heard of anybody dying on it, 
but I heard of people, you know, laying down and making their peace with their maker because they figured that they were probably going to die. Now there are other now an interesting thing about Argeria nervosa is so far as we know from the ethnographic work that's been done, it is unclaimed by any Aboriginal group. Uh, unless we count the surfers of Maui as an <laughs> Aboriginal people. Uh, and this is fascinating to me. You know, certain plants have great antiquity of use, and other plants, equally psychoactive, are ignored. And, you know, we tend to believe that Aboriginal people don't miss a trick. But occasionally it seems like they're as uh, obtuse as we are. Uh, I mean, a couple of examples will make the case clear. Um, as you all probably know, there's quite a complex of psilocybin-containing mushrooms in central Mexico used by the, by the Mazatecan and uh, Mixtecan people there, and they seem to have exploited these mushrooms for millennia. However, on the northwest coast of North America, uh, Washington and British Columbia, where you get the northwest coast Indian groups, the Shimsham, Kwakutl, and Tlingit language areas, this is the densest concentration of psilocybin-containing species of mushrooms on this planet. and. So far as we can tell, they never used them. I mean, somebody will say, well, they used them, but they never told you in the shaman. But listen, you know, a huge amount of ethnography has been done in that area, and there is not the slightest indication that these people ever utilized these mushrooms. Even though they had an advanced shamanism, plant-based shamanism, they seem to have overlooked this. Uh, another example that may have practical implications for some of the more astute among you is uh, in the past two years it's been realized that a plant which grows as a weed in the Midwest of North America um, called um, Illinois bundle weed, Desmanthus illinoisensis, is in fact uh, the most concentrated source of natural DMT in the world on the root scraping of the root. And now, this one is perhaps suspect and maybe more ethnographic work seems to be done. The straight story is that the Indians of the Great Plains never knew about this and never utilized it. My question is, if that's so, then why is it called bundle weed? Because that seems to imply to me a medicine bundle. And, and so perhaps further ethnographic uh, excavation will show that this was used. But it could be the basis for a whole family of visionary hallucinogens that apparently were never utilized. Yeah. Uh, you. Yeah. Oh, uh the focus of uh, some of your most of your work which is essentially this realm you talk about pushing through uh, into um, this visionary world uh, it's a little bit it feels to me when you talk about it, it's a little bit like taking the the glove and turning it inside out that possibly your your uh, your premises is that the universe itself is the illusion and that this visionary world is the reality that we may well be going back into that it's this material world and all the universe and uh, all the material experience that we have is really the, the other side well yes I mean I, I I regard myself as basically an explorer and a researcher I have a lot more questions than answers the thing that has made me be what I am and do what I do is because uh, the, the, what they're telling you about these states of mind are is a whitewash. 
in that they say, oh, it gives you, and these are the pros, the, the people who are for hallucinogens say it's a form of instant psychotherapy, it's great for straightening out your relationship, it's, if you're an architect you can visualize buildings in 3D. And they present it as a tool for understanding this world, its relationships, and its, you know, interconnections. What I've observed is that at high doses and with sufficient intentionality, one seems to break through into what can only be honestly described as a parallel universe of some sort that has such existential presence and immediacy that it's hard to squeeze it down to being a mental construct generated temporarily in your mind through pharmacological means because it seems much more like a place and this is incredibly challenging to our uh, way of thinking about reality because we deny the existence of these kinds of mental realms. Uh, it seems almost as though, or, or here's a model for how it might be, it seems that reality is a series of heavily compartmentalized universes of some sort and under extraordinary situations of mental perturbation achieved by any means, uh, these membranes that keep these worlds mutually exclusive and sequestered from contamination by each other just simply dissolve and you experience what Merciliad called the rupture of plane and the rupture of plane is just like poking a hole in nearby space and then lo and behold you know the utterly unexpected is found to be alive and well right here right now I mean it and I can't stress enough how real this is and how confounding it is I mean I may not be the brightest person around but I certainly have assimilated you know the basic shtick of what Western civilization is supposed to be about and there is no place in the Western model of reality for the idea that just you know 20 heartbeats and 70 milligrams of DMT away is an elf infested uh, <laughs> mega space of archaeolo of, of arcology sized dimensions in which non-material beings made not of matter but of syntax are merrily pursuing uh, their own goals and possibilities. I don't know what to make of that. And I also, <laughs> almost equally puzzling as the existence of such a place, is our lack of knowledge about it when I and hundreds of other people in my experience and presumably millions of people throughout history have known that you could use plant hallucinogens to break in to that world. We're living in a fool's paradise trapped inside the assumptions of linear materialism and rationalism. That's yeah. the most seductive and delicious aspect of your thesis is that, my God, there is a reality somewhere beyond that membrane. And then you compound it with, with the exploration of logic or rationale where you present to us the possibility that the Big Bang is the biggest, is the most ludicrous thing to combine with rationality as could possibly be imagined. And then I've even heard people address, well, how is it possible that the vanity of the individual human being could think that he's so important that the rest of the, the galaxy, the universe out there, that we should be at all significant, whereas you say, well, hell, that's all mindscape. It doesn't exist. Or it feels like you say, well, it's, it's a mindscape. You know, it isn't. It is, it's, it's an invention. Well, wh what I'm really saying is we know a lot less than we assume we know. I mean, if someone tells you that we live around a, a typical star at the edge of a typical galaxy strewn through a mega space trillions of times larger, I mean, they don't know what they're talking about. That's just the cheerful assurance 
of modern astronomy based on a bunch of fishy formulas that were cooked up uh, within the confines of the 20th century. I mean, it, the stars that shine down at night could be uh, painted dots on a scrim for all we know. I mean, I'm not saying that's the case, but what I am saying is uh, I think that the greatest disservice that science has done to humankind is the marginalizing of our own importance. If we even, let's take an objective measure uh, of, com uh, and uh, I think complexity, if you look around at nature, at the fossil record, at the human family, uh, complexity is clearly something very dear to nature. Nature preserves it, nature works through it, nature builds upon it. Well, uh, we're told we're a minor this in orbit around a minor that in a typical that and so forth and so on. But if you will look at the human cerebral cortex, what you discover is the most densely complexified matter known to exist in the universe. The human cerebral cortex contains more connections per cubic centimeter than any form of matter known to exist in this cosmos. If that's true, suddenly our marginality is completely obviated and it's clear that no, we are not marginal observers of a vast cosmic drama. We are uh, at the cutting edge of the development and conservation of complexity. And it is our mind which gives us these scenarios of our, of our position in space and time. It may well be that the human mind is very, very important. The human mind represents the culmination of biology, which is another phenomenon that these astrophysicists always love to marginalize and say, oh, well, biology, it's just going on on one planet as far as we know. It could be a fluke. It may have happened once and it'll never happen again. But, you know, the life of most stars is on the order of 500 million years. We happen to have the good fortune to be in orbit around a very slow-burning, stable star. And so we have ignored the fact that most stars last less than half a billion years. We can dig into the gunflint chert of South Africa and bring up fossils of, of uh, soft-bodied creatures that are close to three billion years old, six times the life of most stars in the universe. So when somebody's trying to tell you that what you, the universe is about is the life and death of stars, they're ignoring the fact that biology is a phenomenon as persistent as any phenomenon known to exist in the universe. And biology is not a static phenomenon. It isn't an endless recycling of of fissionable materials the way star life is, biological life has been steadily complexifying itself over the entire time span of its existence. So life is not marginal. Mind emerging out of life at its more complex levels of organization is not marginal. And we are not marginal. We are, I think, tremendously important in the cosmic drama and that a rational analysis of the situation will support that. Yeah. You comment in that regard. You comment on Margosi mentioned the guy I talked to earlier. Lynn Margosi's theory that, that, that all, all of life, all of plant life is a reorganization of bacteria and all of animal life is a further reorganization of bacterial life just to get bacteria to move around from place to place. And the cerebral cortex is just a lot of that modified spirochetes that have organized themselves in a certain way. And then in, that, in, in my reading of her, the, the way you put human beings in this picture is that we're just an experiment in the way station of bacterial life, which may or may not work. In other words, our destiny is not really in our hands. To think that we can control our fate is really hubris or, this, or illusion. Well, it's certainly illusion. I mean, it's pretty clear we don't control our fate. Yes, you see, one way of looking at evolution, I mean, I just offer this as a heuristic insight, is that life achieved absolute perfection with the first organism. And then this first organism underwent mutation. 
that's a kind of damage which it then repaired the mutation through a strategy of complexification and then there was more mutation and more repair through complexification so what we represent is a massive chunk of scar tissue uh, the culmination of billions of years of repairing the perfect first life form and all this complexity that has been added on since the first achievement is simply a response to the damage done to it by incoming cosmic radiation I don't believe that you see that's a theory where you assume everything is driven by the past I think that uh, that what is really hanging up modern biology is its absence its unwillingness to entertain the possibility that life is driven by purpose this is an old chestnut in the philosophy of science it's called the issue of teleology teleology is a fancy word meaning purpose and the what happened you see is it's just simply a legacy of our intellectual history when Darwin developed when Darwin developed the theory of evolution in the 19th century English intellectual society was under the sway of uh, Christianity and it was possible as recently as 150 years ago to claim yourself to be an intellectual and to actually maintain in polite society that the earth was created by God at 9 a.m. on September the 4th, uh, 4004 B.C. 150 years ago in England, people believed this with perfect confidence that they were at the cutting edge of intellectual understanding. Well, uh, Darwin wanted to overcome deism which was this all-pervasive belief in, in an interventionist creator who was literally guiding the flight of every atom and the fall of every leaf. And Darwin said, we don't need this kind of invasive, deistic uh, plenum. Uh, let's just take the process of mutation, a random process, driven by he knew not what we now know largely driven by incidental cosmic radiation reaching the surface of the earth let's take uh, mutation and natural selection another random process and when we run these two random processes head on lo and behold out come flamingos cockroaches hummingbirds coral reefs palm trees and ourselves uh, but I think that, and you know, his, the co-discoverer of evolution, who, if I believed in reincarnation, I would claim him as my own, uh, Alfred Russell Wallace, was unable to agree with Darwin, and he said, no, that accounts for minor change in organisms, natural selection, but how can you use those processes to account for something like, for instance, the metamorphosis of insects? A caterpillar changing into a butterfly involves the chemical coordination of hundreds, if not thousands, of genes doing a perfectly integrated and flawless ballet of transformation. How incrementally could you ever get a situation where a caterpillar undergoes mutation into a butterfly unless there is some third factor at work in evolution and uh, Wallace thought that it was an appetition an appetite a tendency toward an end state and that compass notion of evolution means that you're steering toward a goal now in common speech when we use the word evolution we usually mean this but orthodox biologists I remember when I was studying evolution I had a professor who said do not use the word evolution unless you are talking about a process involving genes in other words don't talk about the evolution of the novel 
or of abstract expressionism or the evolution of society or the evolution of a political viewpoint. This is all bad thinking. Well, people like Ilya Prigozhin, West Churchman, Eric Yonch have, have reclaimed evolution as the notion of progressive motion movement toward uh, higher and higher states of development. But 19th century evolutionists refuse to talk about advanced and less advanced or higher and lower when they talked about evolution. They just saw it as a random process playing itself out. I don't think so. I think we are called that nature is uh, hyperdimensional in its architectonics and that we are flowing toward a culminating purpose, probably the shedding of matter as the vehicle of our becoming. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to ask you a question about, um, do you think the information that is contained in psilocybin, DMT, all the you know, hallucinogenics, do you think that the information is self-contained or is it actually more of just a way of tuning our brains into a more cosmic frequency that exists in the psilocybin or is the psilocybin just a mediator to, tune, to a, a drastic way of, of tuning into a, a more cosmic broadcast? Well, it's hard for me to imagine that it could be in the psilocybin because uh, psilocybin is a very simple molecule. I mean, it's a small molecule, it's a planar molecule. Uh, it seems to me what must be happening is that uh, we are embedded in an ocean of information and uh, psilocybin somehow changes our channel slightly. You know, ordinary consciousness is created by a neurotransmitter uh, called serotonin, 5-hydroxytryptamine, uh, suggestively a very close relative of psilocybin and DMT. And it seems to me, I think I mentioned this a little bit in the talk last night, that we have evolved a neurotransmitter which has a the effect of narrowing the focus of consciousness to what is operationally defined by the body as the here and now. In other words, the body is very fragile and site dependent and must be protected from, uh, you know, high levels of radiation, inundation by uh, toxic or life-threatening chemicals like water. I mean, you don't want to have the ocean wash over you or it's a problem. Uh, but that these, these pseudo-neurotransmitters, which are hallucinogens, are not, have not been uh, integrated into normal metabolism because they don't serve the body's need to preserve itself. But what they do serve is an expansion of mental function. And it may be, you know, that these neurotransmitters are in the act of evolving. We no longer need to fear the immediate environment. Well, maybe that's a cheerful overstatement. But uh, it, uh, one would like to think that we no longer need to fear the immediate environment as much as we did when we were locked in competition with other animal species. Now, it's to me highly suggestive uh, the fact that we contain and metabolize DMT in the course of ordinary metabolism. What does it mean that the most powerful of all psychedelic hallucinogens is a part of normal human metabolism? Metabolism. The pineal gland, wh whose function is very mysterious, uh, is uh, doing a lot of chemistry that looks like psychedelic chemistry. It's elaborating uh, harmine-like beta-carbolines. So it's possible that literally when we take these tryptamine hallucinogens, we are, as it were, 
dressing up in the mental furniture of the distant future that we are experiencing a state of consciousness toward which we are naturally evolving and that over time and through natural selection the the serotonergic neurotransmitters are making way for these more more powerful psychedelic compounds and this in and, and the fact well something like imagination looks to me like a self-generated internal involvement with uh, uh, compounds which some at some point in the future might replace the compounds of ordinary metabolism and shift our mental life literally into another dimension yeah uses organic psychedelics for a period of time as a daily dietary supplement like every day for an extended period of time because nobody really talks about that and I'm just how much do you use a gram a gram and a half yes well one can do that um, I sort of I've I've sort of thought that maybe this isn't such a good idea because I'm I'm interested more in spectacular episodes of intoxication with the exception of cannabis of course uh, uh, rather than integrating it as a lifestyle am I the only one that's doing this as a lifestyle? I, mean, I feel really alone right now <laughs> well is there anybody who wants to join this gentleman in his isolation? I at times I've done that but I, I found it to be, well, here, here's the thing. It, you have to get the dose. The dose is very critical. At a, at, if you take, say, I would say a half a gram to a gram every day, my experience of that was simply a kind of anxiety, a kind of a, a being set forward, a speed type effect. Uh, if you take if you say well then I don't want that so I'm going to lift the dose slightly and you go to say two and a half grams the problem I had with that is life quickly evolves into being so strange that you, I couldn't handle it in other words it's very important for me to dip into these places and then to get out towel off and think about it uh, <laughs> Oh, the, however, you know, I, I, there is, a, there is a, a, a streak of the chicken shit in me, I think. If you, if you really want to leave us all behind and, ordin you know, bourgeois values and your job and Bill Clinton and the ozone hole and all of that behind, then if you start taking psilocybin, let's say four grams every three days, I guarantee you within a month there will be very few people that you will have much in common with. <laughs> and, and you will be very happy. You will be very happy with your circumstance generally, I think. But you will have evolved a point of view, a set of values, an expectation that most people will find a, a lot of difficulty relating to. Okay. Like a shroom shape, let's say, fresh fruit, ice, a gram. You're looking at, what, maybe three to five hours of time involved with that? Uh-huh. So that leaves you know, 20 hours left in the day to do everything else you need to do. I mean, I you do, no, but what is the dose again? It's a gram. Huh. Well, I don't know. See, it may be just a matter of personal styles. When I take psilocybin, I give it 110% of my attention. So I can't do it and work at the computer or make phone calls or shop or deliver my children to lessons and stuff like that. And so my idea with it is to completely come down between doses and then you know you're virgin again uh, 
yeah, do you keep, you don't keep hallucinating. No, it becomes something else. See, I, I, I don't want you to feel PA, but I think that what people do with drugs that is probably a bad idea is they take too little too often. And that the best way to do drugs is to take very challenging doses, rarely. I mean, I used to say to my groups, if you haven't taken enough that you think you may have done too much, then you did too little. <laughs> In other words, you, you really want to dissolve the boundary. You don't want to integrate it into this world. You want to have an experience which you can then integrate into this world after the trip. You're the one that always talks about language and thought processes, and I feel as though most of my best work is under that period of one to one and a half grams of dosage. You know? And I just don't understand how you know, the recommended experience is much more than what I'm doing, obviously. And well, then I'm, well, have you taken large doses? Well, isn't that much more interesting? I guess it comes down to what it is you're looking to do while you're doing it. It's not a matter of interesting, it's a matter of what your purpose is, what your intent is, what your right. trip is. Well, at these higher doses, you can't do anything. Of course, that's my point. <laughs> you know, I mean, you, lo you, you hanging on to the floor is a major program to be executed. Uh, yeah. What kind of person exists in the parallel universe? You mean for days and days? Well, yeah. I mean, could you live? You can live, but you alarm your friends <laughs> and quickly become an object of community concern because, <laughs> you know, for ordinary people, you are what is called nuts. <laughs> and does, it just, does the experience just become a type of a, almost like a three-dimensional TV? I mean, you just look at things it's like, Oh, no, I think you underestimate how strange it is. I don't think you could ever get used to these places. Uh, you know, sometimes people ask me if, uh, if DMT is dangerous, and the honest answer is only if you fear death by astonishment. <laughs> and death by astonishment is a real danger in these places. I mean, these places are not simply strange or amazing or highly peculiar. They are absolutely confounding. I mean, that's what I'm trying to get across is this is not some, this is not going to require just some minor adjustment of our worldview. These are the things they said were impossible. The things they promised, assured, were impossible are possible. Uh, the, the greatest secret that has been kept from us is that the world is a thousand times, a million times stranger than your wildest supposition. And how they keep the lid on this stuff, I do not understand. I mean, I don't understand why I'm the only person saying this, because I'm completely convinced of my own uh, ordinariness. I am, I am only a human being. I represent all of you. What happens to me would happen to you. It isn't, there's nothing special about me. Well then, my God, how do they keep the lid on this stuff? It's weird. It's more, if, if, if a fleet of flying saucers were to land on the south lawn of the White House tomorrow, it would, not, it would not change the fact that the weirdest thing in the universe is the DMT flash. Flying saucers landing on the south lawn of the White House is a positively mundane possibility <laughs> compared to this thing which is real. It's here. It's now. You don't have to go to Babaji. You don't have to go to the Himalayas. All, it's, it's, it's three tokes away. And and yet, you know, we argue, is it possible? What does it mean? Is it this? Is it that? It's amazing to me. I mean, it is the new world. It, the Europeans eventually discovered the new world. 
But they had to sail galleons three months through hell to get there. This is three tokes and 30 seconds away. And it is the absolute confounding exhibit of the whole structure of Western civilization. How can they keep the lid on it? I don't get it. This person. Where does um, individual spiritual development fit in without the use of, of uh, hallucinogens in uh, your world or in to your scheme of thinking? And two, last night you talked about the business of being should, should be the cultivation of, lo of love. And I'd like to hear more about that now or later. And then third, I'd like to know what do you think you would be doing today in life if you had never used any psychedelics? <laughs> Well, first to the spiritual question, which is an interesting question to me. Uh, everyone casts the psychedelic experience in terms of being a subcategory of the spiritual quest. I'm not exactly sure about that. I've taken lots of psychedelics over nearly 30 years now and, you know, I have a marriage dissolving. I have people who will tell you I'm a terrible person to negotiate a contract with. Uh, I feel myself to be a, a moral paragon of nothing. Uh, and, and I'm not sure it has anything to do with the spiritual quest. It seems to me true spirituality is a very here and now matter. One should visit the sick and imprisoned, clothe the naked, bury the dead, care for orphans, feed the hungry. That's what the spiritual life is about. It's very down to earth, straightforward. Uh, I'm very puzzled, and, and I put more than psychedelics in this, in this category. What like mantras, yantras, practices, do these things really ameliorate the suffering of the human condition? They may be good for something. The question is what? Uh, perhaps indirectly the psychedelics synergize the spiritual life because they just show you that life is to be taken seriously and there is a great deal of it to be assimilated, but uh, in terms of suggesting that you are a more spiritually advanced person if you take psychedelics, I don't really see any evidence for that. I do think that, that you cannot take psychedelics without losing a portion of your ego because it will, it's too hard for the egomaniac to take psychedelics. The egoist will turn away from it, will have such bad trips that they will put it down, I think. Um, this is an interesting question, this question of, of, you know, like the question I ask myself, here we are, we are psychedelic people, presumably by some high percentage. Are we in any way morally superior to people who don't take psychedelics? Maybe we're a little bit gentler and more open-minded, but probably in any mud wrestling situation, we can be just as uh, down and dirty as the next person uh, to some degree. So I, I see it more as, that's why I don't think of myself as a guru. I think of myself as an explorer of a geography the purposes of which are probably multiple. In other words, uh, I suppose we can use psychedelics to shape personalities and brainwash people and control them. Uh, and I suppose we can use it to lead people to make peace with death, mortality, their own limitations. It seems to me it's a morally neutral dimension and, and it can be used for good or ill and maybe slightly edging toward the good because it's very hard for egomaniacs to do anything with this stuff. The CIA's involvement with LSD is an instructive 
situation. The CIA got on to LSD well ahead of everybody else, and the first notion was, and if you're interested in this, you can read J. Stephen, or not, no, the other one, Acid Dreams, that Martin book, Lee. Martin Lee's book, and, and Schlein was the co-author. The, LS, uh, the CIA's first assumption about LSD was that it was a kind of super truth serum and that they could kidnap KGB agents and give them LSD and they would spew out all their contacts and so forth and so on. So uh, a year of researching that possibility convinced them they were on the wrong track. And so then they decided it isn't a truth serum, it's an anti-truth serum. <laughs> We will give our agents this drug, <laughs> and if they ever fall into enemy hands, they will take it, and then it will be impossible for the enemy to get any coherent account out of them of what is going on. Well, so then a few months of that, and they discovered, no, under some circumstances, our people just to tell all under LSD. So then they decided that they could program a Manchurian candidate type situation with it. Well then that was abandoned and I think largely they have lost interest in this stuff. I asked in the Amazon, I asked the mushroom at one point because I could see that we were going to carry it back to the world in some form. I said, can't this be perverted? Can't it be misused? And it said, uh, only, the, only the good can come near this. Well, maybe good doesn't mean exactly what we think it means. You know, it isn't a kind of piety worn on your cuff. It's, uh, it's something else. It's a sincere wish to understand. That's the motivation that the psychedelics will turbocharge. As to your question about what would I be doing if I hadn't taken psychedelics, well, I don't know. What I was doing, what I assumed I would end up doing before I took psychedelics was hopefully end up teaching art history in a very exclusive Eastern girls' school somewhere uh, for a long, long time. It was a kind of Nabokovian lechery was uh, my life's plan. And, and what was your... Oh, and love. Love. Well, my analysis of what psychedelics do if you think not about my trip or your trip but thousands tens of thousands of these experiences what can we say that would be true of every psychedelic experience every high dose psychedelic experience what can we say that would be a general truism what you could say is that psychedelics dissolve boundaries that's what they do the boundary between nature and society, between mind and body, between self and other, they dissolve boundaries. And this is what love does when it, when it is working right. I mean, you are able to place yourself in the second position for a child, for a lover, for a cause, for whatever it is, you know, you, you take second position. And, and so I see them essentially as uh, aphrodisiacs of a strange sort. They empower not, not, you know, genital prowess, but real caring by showing that, the, that all differences are illusions, that what is real is the unbroken, seamless plenum of being. And, and this is what we need to learn because our whole social construct has been based on the establishment and maintenance of boundaries. I mean, we are the most boundary-obsessed human society that has ever existed. Uh, you know, when I go to the Amazon and spend time with the upriver people, the hardest thing for me to get used to is that I never have any privacy, ever. You know, I hang my hammock in the longhouse 
and you know people are fighting and giving birth and having sex and arguing and doing all these things and even when you e even the act of defecation is not necessarily private so uh, boundary dissolution and boundary maintenance is what really car anxiety about these things is what characterizes our society i think and i We'll mention it briefly here before the break that uh, some of you may have somehow escaped being exposed to my theory of human evolution, which is contained in Food of the Gods. Uh, I think that we achieved a kind of perfection in human relations and in the relationship between human beings and nature uh, sometime in the last million years and that we maintained that relationship till as recently as 15,000 years ago and we achieved this through a quasi symbiotic or an in, let's put it this way an incipiently symbiotic relationship to psilocybin you see I'll give this to you in the short form because probably most of you have heard it uh, all primates organize themselves uh, uh, using male dominance hierarchies. You go clear back into lemurs and squirrel monkeys, and it's the hard-muscled, sharp-fanged young males who set the agenda, and everybody else, women, children, weak older males, have to dance to that, uh, to that tune. Uh, this is a characteristic of primate organization. It is also a characteristic of our society today as we sit here and we know that the suppression not only of women as individuals but of the feminine itself as an idea has made us tremendously, uh, has blocked our potential and made us tremendously neurotic. Well, I think that when we came down out of the trees we were male dominators, hierarchically organized creatures, and then we encountered psilocybin as an item within our diet. And without anybody realizing what was happening, it constituted a chemical intervention against hierarchical organization. And uh, an orgiastic means sharing of, of sexual partners, style, arose in the wake of accepting psilocybin into the diet. Psilocybin promoted uh, in low doses increased visual acuity. This is an established fact. And that allowed the psilocybin mem using members of the species to outbreed the non-psilocybin using members. And human consciousness evolving, had been evolving, continued to evolve, and through the augmentation of psilocybin fell into a relationship of direct experience with this goddess-like Gaian totality, the mind of the earth. And then there was a, a dynamic, satisfying uh, balance between the expression of human advanced cognitive faculties and a human sense of our place in nature and our roles vis-a-vis -vis each other and so forth and so on. In short, paradise. And it persisted for, who knows, let's say a million years. And it only faded when the mushrooms became, through climatological change and migration, unavailable. And when the mushroom became scarce and scarcer and unavailable, after a million years of chemical suppression of the primate tendency to form dominance hierarchies, the old behavior, which had never been genetically removed from the picture, re-emerged 12,000 years ago, no more. And, and uh, it was, must have been like hell itself. People suddenly no longer were caring for each other. Suddenly men wanted to control the sexual and reproductive activities of women. Uh, the concept of territory 
emerged. This is at the precise moment in time when agriculture was invented. Agriculture put an end to the nomadic yearly wanderings of the human family. It put a emphasis on sedentary uh, lifestyles. The problem with agriculture, especially in the early phase, was that it was so phenomenally successful. You can imagine farming the alluvial detritus of these river valleys that had never been touched. Surpluses were created. Surplus, in the presence of a dominator or hierarchical attitude, must be defended. And so suddenly you have haves and have-nots, us and them. The, the most advanced structure on this planet 11,000 years ago was the grain tower at Jericho. It was, uh, it was a storage area for grain and it was a tower so that you could beat back attacks by hungry neighbors that you no longer identified with sufficiently to share your food. And in the absence of psilocybin, this structure emerged in the psyche which we call ego. If you have psilocybin in your diet, the ego, it's like taking chemotherapy or something. The calcareous tumor of ego is never able to form in a situation where psilocybin is being taken, group sexual experiences in a religious context are being orchestrated at the new and full moon, uh, sharing of food, sharing of child care, sharing of sexual partners, all that is ended when the, when the ego is born and the ego is the boundary establisher par excellence because it establishes me and mine as opposed to you and yours. And uh, uh, with the invention of agriculture, the establishment of large sedentary populations, that means cities, uh, the establishment of specialized roles, that means kingship, the emergence of male dominance, the emergence of warfare. These are the institutions that are fatal to our higher aspirations, to our hopes, even at this moment as they were 10 to 15,000 years ago. That's why I think, you know, we have to chemically intervene because we have fallen into a dysfunctional relationship toward the components of our own psyche. And it, it's fine if monkeys want to dominate each other, but when you have, in the space in which we existed in the psilocybin-maintained partnership mode, we developed language symbolic representation, dance, theater, so forth and so on, and we acquired and empowered the tremendous imagination that has allowed us to build the cultures that we see around us. That kind of power is only safe in the hands of collective community-minded uh, creatures. And in the hands of ego-driven creatures, it leads straight to Auschwitz and the hydrogen bomb, as it did. So I think, you know, history is a state of chemical deprivation that allows animal, ancient animal patterns of behavior that degrade and confuse us to reemerge and stabilize themselves. Response to that. You mean in the present situation? If the assumption is that there is scarcity now, then, then what would that invoke? If surplus well, what it invokes is an ever greater distance between those at the top and those at the bottom of the social pyramid, and an ever fiercer uh, and, more, and an emergence of ever more brutal behavior patterns, which is what we see happening. I mean, our world is getting uglier and meaner and more mean-spirited by the moment because those who have are so anxious about the fact that they might be asked to share it. I mean, what we have gone through in the last 12 years in this country is a tremendous transfer of wealth 
to the upper 2% of society and concomitantly a tremendous spread of anxiety, alienation, and uh, a dehumanizing of the entire social enterprise. I mean, if we don't get hold of ourselves, uh, the next century, most of the world is going to be a toxic desert, and then here and there, there will be very well-defended pleasure domes in which a very small number of incredibly wealthy people will live out lives of utterly self-indulgent hedonistic fantasy in denial of the moral catastrophe that they participated in in order to achieve that hedonic uh, state of isolation. I mean, that's clearly happening. It, metaphorically, that's what we have already. I mean, not to freak you out, but that's where we're sitting right now, you know? I mean, compared to Bosnia and Haiti and Somalia. create defensiveness, then what is the alternative? Well, it, it neither create defensiveness except in the presence of the ego. In other words, what we have to do is teach people to care for each other as a primary value, not something you do after you know you pay for your Mercedes and all that, but as the primary value. We have to have community. It's very simple. We don't have community. We have a, a free-for-all where the devil takes the hindmost, the most brutal and ruthless among us rise to the top, and everybody else uh, uh, has a foot on their neck. Uh, we, we are now in a hell of a fix because we've waited so long to address these problems. Uh, there is not now enough gold, aluminum, uh, iron, so forth, in the planet to raise everyone to a middle-class standard as it's enjoyed in Southern California. And yet we have unleashed these expectations in everyone by flagellating people with uh, images of material wealth and comfort. The whole, we must re-empower the individual and the quality of individual experience. In other words, you have to convince somebody that you are a richer person on five grams of psilocybin than you are if you live in a five million dollar house and are spending fifty thousand dollars a year on psychotherapy because you're miserable, you see. Uh, we have allowed ourselves to be tremendously disempowered by allowing our values to shift toward the material domain. You can't take it with you, folks, uh, but the soul is the vehicle that you do take with you into whatever dimensions of continuity exist beyond this mortal coil. So instead of balancing uh, uh, and replacing the tires on your Porsche, you should be balancing and replacing the tires on your after-death vehicle. After all, uh, that's the one that's going to have to serve you well in the clinches, you see. Yeah. How have you worked with the terror in dissolving, you know, on your journey, how have you worked with the terror in dissolving the ego boundaries? Well, you're right, there is a component of terror in this kind of work. You know, the Rolling Stones song, you don't get what you want, you get what you need, is never more true than with psychedelics. But in terms of practical suggestions, uh, fear is has many aspects, but one aspect of it is it has a chemistry. And the chemistry of fear is fairly short term. You've probably all experienced driving on the freeway and somebody cuts right in front of you and there is a, a it feels like your body temperature must rise about five degrees in about a third of a second. It's an incredibly fast chemistry that goes on there. And then in about five seconds, you fall back down to within normal parameters. Uh, the one way to deal with fear is sit still and wait. 
In other words, the psychedelic terror is usually fairly unfocused. It is simply raw terror. Well, just sit still and shut up and watch the chemicals in your mind tear those molecules apart and rarely can the fear sustain itself more than five or ten minutes because it has to it has the force of a blow but then you can you can sustain the blow and chemical equilibrium returns the other thing and this is great very good advice don't forget it it's hard for western people to keep it on their plate uh, sing sing the way we relate to terror is we crunch clench withdraw and hunch over in some kind of fetal position like you're being beat on what you want to do is is sit up straight straighten your spinal column open your air passages and begin to cycle oxygen through and if you sing uh, in a very few minutes, the chemical foundations of the fear will be will be washed away. So that's very practical. So the per mantra. It doesn't okay. matter. Mantra, yantra, you know, everything becomes profound on psychedelics. I mean, I tend toward row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. Well, I see it's lunchtime. Why don't we uh, break? Keep your keep your questions. We'll uh, come back at about a quarter of two, and then we'll push on to the summit. Hopefully. <laughs> Thanks very much. Oh yes, what a heart sinking assumption. No, my, my, my assumption was that we could uh, skate by on questions alone. <laughs> but what is your question? <laughs> Uh -huh. There were no questions. Okay. So uh, 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 an oblique request to override questions. <laughs> Basically what happens is I end up saying what I want to say anyhow because you may have noticed a certain logical gap between some of the questions and some of the answers. That's not a failure of your own understanding that's what's going on as a matter of fact you know uh, uh, but you had a question I just wanted to kind of introduce a new idea here I mean it's probably an old idea but also a new idea um, I, I this was years ago that I, I played the Ouija board a lot and one strange evening I was playing and, and I asked the question who are we talking to when we speak to the Ouija board and um, the, the reply was, in your future, man will be able to speak with his ancestors, contrary to popular belief that you were speaking to your ancestors, which meant basically that in our future, we're going to discover ways to, to talk to the past and deliver messages through the past. And in connection with the UFO experience, I was wondering if quite possibly that, that the extraterrestrial was actually us in the future coming back, you know, discover the technology of, of, of traveling through time, you know, and I was just wondering if you had anything to say about that. Now watch how this question is perverted into a, a, a episode of speechifying on my part. I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> Well, I mean, I've thought a lot about this. Uh, we, I suppose in order to get into it, what I should do 
is just take a moment or two to actually describe for you my idea or my uh, account of what it is that lies at the very center uh, or at least as far into the center as I've been able to push of these experiences. Uh, to my mind, uh, I, I mean, I mentioned here this morning that DMT seems to me the most powerful of these things. What powerful means in that context is that more of the motifs are present at greater energy than they are uh, in some of these other compounds. And, you know, at the risk of repeating myself, what happens to most people, I think, if they are able to remember it, uh, what an actual DMT flash is like is, uh, you know, you it, this stuff, it's vaporized in a glass pipe, it's smoked, it comes on in about half a minute or less and is immensely stronger than any amount of psilocybin or LSD could conceivably be, I think. And what happens is, uh, and I'll speak in the first person just to make it manageable, uh, uh, what happens is I break into uh, a space. First of all, I am fully myself. In other words, I am exactly who I was before. That's why on one level I say DMT doesn't affect your mind. You are not euphoric, ecstatic. You are exactly who you were before. But there is a sense of pushing through a membrane of some sort. There's actually a sound as though someone had wadded up a cellophane bread wrapper. That crackling sound which some people assumed erroneously were brain cells frying in your cerebellum. A friend of mine said, it's, it's your soul as radio intellecty leaving your body through the top of your head. Well, whatever it is, you burst into a space, I burst into a space that is uh, inhabited. That's the first shocker is there is no ambiguity about it because there's an ear-splitting cheer as you break into this space. It's an elf nest of some sort. <laughs> and there are hundreds of these self-dribbling jeweled basketballs, sort of. I mean, that's a heavy download into English of what they are. But they are autonomous, separate from the background, and they bound forward, screaming hello, basically. And um, for someone who expected insight into their relationship or their financial circumstances, <laughs> this is a fairly, you know, a fairly astonishing and rapid turn of development. And, uh, and they are intently focused upon you. I mean, when it happens to me, they, 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 they yell hooray, and then they are like long-lost acquaintances. They literally pour over you. They crawl over you. You're being hugged by a troop of hyperspatial machine elves. And they say, you know, you stay away so long. You send so many, but you come so rarely. <laughs> Uh, and we're so happy to see you. And then, and there is a sense of being somehow, without being able to cognize the logic of it, you're underground. You can tell that you're far underground. And these things, the main thing going on in this place is that these things are creatures of language. They are elves of syntactical intent. They appear to be made of language, not matter. And they are in a process of continuous semantic transformation. Meaning is crawling across their surfaces in a state of continual metamorphosis. And they are uh, emitting sounds, 
roughly analogous to some kind of, of music or language, except that this is like no music or language you've ever heard, because what it is, is it is something capable of being visibly apprehended. It's sound which you can see. It's linguistic structure whose syntax is visible in three-dimensional space. And they um, use their voices to make objects, which are, in some sense, the central focus of the experience. Because out of the air, out of their bodies, out of your body, they condense, create, and pluck these objects which they offer for your inspection. And as you lean forward to look at one of these things, midst this clamor of elf hysteria, you, as I said, are fully yourself. Your judgment is not impaired. You're, and, and in fact, they are saying to you, fight excitement. Do not abandon yourself to amazement. In other words, they're telling you, stay down. Don't just go off on some arm-waving rave about how this is impossible and outlandish and outrageous. Try to stay focused on what we're doing. And what they show you are objects that are intrinsically and inherently impossible. So that these things made of tools, gold, ivory, cut stone, flesh, music, hope, odor, I mean, it's hard to talk about, but when you direct your attention towards these things, you can tell by looking at it that if you could get it into three-dimensional space, if I could suddenly whip one out of my briefcase and display it to you, our world, our intellectual constructs would collapse upon themselves because this is impossible, impossibly beautiful, impossibly constructed, defying of the laws of physics and of chemistry. So is, is there a, a, do you think there's a multi-dimensional life force that is the same through the entire dimension? And then that is a, that's a higher dimension, actually, maybe from the future, maybe, I mean, as, as far as three-dimensional time is concerned, there is no such thing. Well, but besides what we've created, so are they actually trying to tell you that, okay, everything you see is impossible is not really impossible. Introducing to you that nothing is impossible and that that is our future way of thinking, is that nothing is impossible any longer, otherwise we're doomed. Well, I have a sort of an, I almost said rational, but let's say at least orderly kind of mind. So I, I tried to understand, you know, what could this be? So you make a list of hypotheses and then think about each hypothesis and test it against the evidence. Okay, hypothesis one, DMT is not a drug. It is an extraterrestrial communication device. These are creatures somewhere in the universe who are so different from us that they come to us not in starships the size of Manhattan, but in drug molecules uh, that are dinky. So uh, we are in contact here with some kind of extraterrestrial technology, and these are true aliens of some sort. And God knows the weirdness of the situation supports the hypothesis. Okay, second hypothesis. Uh, there is a parallel universe, unsuspected by most human beings. It's right here all the time. It's inhabited. These things have their own hopes, fears, problems, so forth. And somehow this drug just erases this boundary and then you're, you find yourself in the elf nest. Okay, next hypothesis. These things, because they have great affection for me, because they seem intent on the, prog on the task of communicating, perhaps they are uh, human beings from the distant future. Perhaps this is what we are fated to become. 
you know, there's always, since we were kids, the cliché, beings of pure energy. Well, it's always been a little hard to wrap your mind around what that would look like, but lo and behold, here appear to be creatures of pure energy. Uh, but there are a lot of problems with hypothesizing a future human technological breakthrough which would allow them to actually manipulate the past. Uh, logical paradoxes and that sort of thing. Uh, well, so then here's another possibility. They are human beings, but they are not in the future in the ordinary sense or in the past. They are in the prenatal and post-life phase. In other words, these are either the, the unborn waiting in some limbo-like dimension to descend into matter, or they are, in fact, uh, people who have had a sojourn in the domain of organic existence and now have moved on. Let me not kid you, we're talking about dead people here in that case. Well, if you go to the, if you go to the shamans who, who access these places through ayahuasca or the varola snuffs or something like that, they will say, uh, well, these are ancestors. Didn't you read Mersiliad? Don't you know that shamanism works through ancestor magic? Well, ancestor is a tremendously sanitized term for dead people. And if what is actually happening here is that the much argued about soul is actually made visible, by this pharmacological strategy. I mean, God knows why, but God knows why anything else is the way it is. Then this is truly big news. This is the confounding of rationalism. If what is happening is that by pushing the frontiers of pharmacology, we discover a way to even momentarily and temporarily erase the boundary between the living and the dead, then this is a 180 degree turn on the evolution of culture that not even the most uh, technically infatuated among us are prepared to assimilate. I mean, it's no, it's no challenge on that scale of things to expect visitors from Zenebel Ganubi or Zeta Reticuli or some other distant piece of real estate, but to expect visitors from, uh, you know, beyond the grave that's a little confounding. And over time, I've sort of come to incline to the idea that this is what is in fact going on. And the reason it's so hard to bring anything out of the DMT flash is because at the center of the flash, you find out something so unexpected, so appalling, and so existentially convincing in the moment of confronting it, that you simply immediately block it out and obliterate it. And then, and, and these things are very focused on getting you to do what they're doing. I mean, they say, you can do what we are doing. Do it. Do it. And what they want you to do is use your voice to make objects appear in visual space as though language, admittedly the phenomenon with which we are involved in a way that no other animal species on this planet is, but that language as practiced by human beings is an incomplete enchantment and that pushed to its limits, language becomes not something heard with the ears, but something seen with the eyes on the brink, potentially, through pharmacological re-engineering of ourselves and, and through studying of these shamanic states of mind, about to move into a domain where we see each other's thoughts. Now, normally when we conceive of telepathy, we think of it as, uh, you hear what I think. Telepathy is, you see what I mean. You see, telepathy is a function which goes on in the domain of seeing, not of hearing. And 
why this is important, rather than just some weird psychic ability, uh, is because our boundaries are based on our relationship to our language. If you could see what I mean, in a fairly profound sense, you would be me. In a much more profound sense than when you hear what I say. Because, think about it for a minute, analyze what normal, ordinary communication is. I want to communicate with you. I consult my internal dictionary and I carefully choose words out of my dictionary and I string them together according to the rules of English syntax. I then activate, uh, if I've done things in the right order, I then activate my vocal apparatus. I impart a vibration, an acoustical wave, onto the surrounding medium, which is air. This vibration moves across space it enters through the holes on both sides of your head as a pressure wave. You then, analyzing this incoming waveform, rush to your dictionary and you break up this incoming wave signature and attempt to map it to words in your dictionary. Now, if your dictionary and my dictionary are the same, then you will, lo and behold, reconstruct my thought in the confines of your brain-mind system. But notice the caveat that was slipped in there. If your dictionary and my dictionary are the same. But they never are. I mean, maybe they are if you ask, can you tell me what time it is, or would you please turn down the stereo? But if you're talking about anything of interest, depth, ambiguity, or complexity, then chances are uh, your dictionary and my dictionary only generally uh, assimilate to congruency with each other. So then uh, ambiguity creeps in. You think you understand. I think you understand. And on that shaky foundation, we begin to build further semi-understandings. And then we drift off in the general direction of misapprehension eventually. Well, if you could see what I mean, there would be no ambiguity in our communication because uh, uh, we would, the intention of language would be established in visual space with an existential modality about it similar to sculpture. I would make it, but having made it, you and I would both examine it, walk around it, and have the faith that we were looking at the same thing. And this would tend to erase our boundaries. So it's very clear that communication of the ordinary sort, small mouth noises transduced across acoustical space and symbolic notations thereof, have created the global civilization that we're living inside of. But how much more collectivist, how much more community we would have if we could see what each other mean. And so I, uh, I'm beginning to assume that the proper way to think about these hallucinogens is as catalysts for language formation, as catalysts for the project of communication, and that the end result of the, of the project of communication is that we become what we behold. In other words, there is not the sense of the observed and the observer, these two polarities of an experience are merged in the act of pure perception. And this, this is something emerging out of our biological organization. It's not a cultural development the way a new invention or a new mathematical algorithm or something like that would be. It's, it's uh, a, an evolution of our neural of our neural capacity. And then let me just say one more thing about it and then we can talk about it. There is a model for this in nature that makes clear, I think, 
what I'm driving at. As many of you know, octopi change colors. We learn this from wonderful television programs about nature that keep us from being in nature, but nevertheless inform us of the details of nature. Uh, octopi change color. They have a very large repertoire of dots, blushes, spottings, ripples, and so forth. It was for a long time thought that this was camouflage. Now it's been understood by people who study animal communication that this is not camouflage, this is language. The octopus does not make small mouth noises that uh, move through space because in the aqueous medium uh, there are certain physical problems that make that an improbable way to do business. What the octopus does is it is its own syntax. It doesn't generate syntax, it becomes syntax. So the mind of the octopus is worn on its surface. Its thoughts ripple across its geometry as color changes. It is in effect, operationally, a naked mind. Not a naked brain, a naked mind. So when one octopus encounters another, by the mere act of looking, it can tell how long it's been since the other one has eaten, how long it's been since it's had sex, what its general attitude toward the world is at that moment, uh, so forth and so on. It is able to visually apprehend the mental universe of the other. This is why octopi extrude ink into the water. It's because it's the only way they can create a private dimension for themselves because for an octopus to be beheld is to be understood. So you can think of octopus ink as correction fluid for misspoken cephalopods, if you like. <laughs> well, in a sense, this is what we, I think, are headed for. In a way, we can already do this in a very crude way. We have faces. No other animal has a face. Other animals have fronts to their heads. But we have faces. It's an area where a lot of musculature is under the surface, uh, is under the control of the intent to communicate. So by scowling, squinting, rolling one's eyes, looking away, so forth and so on, we communicate. Imagine if that communicative ability, rather than being confined to a few square inches on the front of the skull, were to spread out over the entire body. And of course for the octopus in an aqueous medium, it can fold and unfold itself, it can reveal and hide parts of its body very quickly. It can in fact communicate faster than we can communicate with small mouth noises. And this ability to communicate is so important to the biological foundations of octopus existence that when the octopi, who all of whom, or all of which, I'm not sure, uh, evolved in the shallow waters near c coastlines, when those environments became evolutionarily crowded, the octopi evolved into the benthic depths, into the parts of the ocean where no light ever reaches. But in order to maintain lines of communication, over long periods of time, they evolved phosphorescent organs on their bodies, and eyelid-like membranes covering those phosphorescent organs. So in the benthic depths of the sea, all that one octopus ever encounters of another is its pure linguistic intent. Nothing else can be seen. So I think that uh, the DMT elves, I mean, all I can figure is that they are trying to catalyze us to move up the scale in the refining of the bandwidth of our communication skills. Yeah. Do you feel that after your experience with them, the DMT elves, did you come any closer to? expressing your communication through those means. 
Uh, you mean, do I feel more able to do that? Yeah, do you feel like you're any closer, or is it otherwise just maybe an entertainment instead of an enlightenment, if we aren't able to actually reach it? Well, uh, no, I mean, they, they uh, urge one toward a kind of glossolalia, a kind of ecstatic verbal activity that is devoid of attachment to the culturally contrived dictionary. And for a long time, I could hear them do this. I could hear this stuff, this DMT gibberish flowing through my mind. And then eventually, I became able to do it. Uh, and it's immensely satisfying. This relates back to what we discussed this morning about how um, there's DMT in the human brain being produced for some reason. You see, we do tend to connect successful linguistic activity with the visual cortex. In other words, if somebody successfully communicates something to you, you say, I see what you mean. Now it's clear to me you've painted a picture. Why is it that when we want to say that language is succeeding, we reach for visual metaphors? It's because we trust our eyes. We don't trust our ears. The world is defined for us as something seen. And uh, the ambiguity of ordinary communication, which is culturally defined, and for each of us defined by basically where on the surface of the planet you first saw the light of day, you know, the French speak French, the Dutch speak Dutch, why can't the English learn how to speak? Or no, that's something else. Uh, uh, but if, but what I'm talking about is an or language that you don't learn from a culture, but that you learn in the same way that you know how to breathe, you know how to eat, you know how to grasp. It's in the organic structure rather than in the cultural uh, software. Yeah. But is it the communication? Is it with other, can you communicate with others? Other human beings? Yes. On this level? On oh, well, you can if you're both loaded on DMT, but uh, that's such a chaotic environment in which to sort this kind of stuff out. That's what drove me to the Amazon in the first place, was the DMT flash is so maddeningly short. I mean, you're trying to sort all this out and assure yourself you're not dead as a doornail in about two and a half minutes. And I thought, you know, we need to slow it down and stretch it out. Why does it have to be like a Bugs Bunny cartoon run backwards at five times normal speed? I mean, you just cannot get a grasp on it. And over the years, judicious manipulation of these substances and all kinds of special conditions, eventually you see what it is. And it's almost as though language is trying to be born out of matter. The pure energy thing of 50s science fiction may in fact be a fairly accurate take on where we're headed. We are headed toward becoming pure syntactical intentionality, just shedding the monkey, shedding any umbilical cord into matter. Matter is becoming a fairly uncomfortable dimension for us to be in, and I dare say matter would probably be highly relieved to have us just move on <laughs> so that the rainforest, chipmunks, glaciers, and schooling salmon could go back to doing what they do best. Nicole. The what? Elementals. Elementals, got it. Elementals, you know, the rocks, the water, the fire, the air. And in the ancient literature, the, um, uh, you know, 
the different civilizations have spoken about those, and usually they always relate to them as having a spirit which manifests itself in the shapes of elves and nymphs. And usually the elves and the little dwarves are associated with elves, selves, selva, the forest, the mother, the earth. And the water usually has uh, more feminine nymphs. And so I was thinking, since you took the mushroom, which is, you know, very much of a forest of an earth element, you know, maybe the mushroom opened the door to you for that elemental of the earth. Well, it, this could be. I mean, all I've ever seen of that other universe is an area smaller than this room. And yet I assume that other universe is probably equal in size to our own. So I'm not exactly Ferdinand Magellan uh, where it's concerned, you know? Well, yeah, but it's just, you know, a little glimpse at it. And there is other, other people have talked about it, like, for instance, uh, the uh, tribal men, the shamans, and uh, not shamans, you know, had experiences where they did encounter beings that talked to them and give a message. And, you know, uh, Castaneda talked about it, uh, Lynn Andrews talked about the uh, little nymphs of the water, and other Indians, you know, have basically, even through their oral tradition, kind of passed on that kind of a message that there are, the world has different layers of reality. And they are all accessible and available if one is, you know, if the boundaries can be broken enough so that our flow of energy can really access these other layers. Yeah, I think our materialism has, has focused us so entirely away from these more rarefied layers that we cannot see them at all that we, in fact, deny their existence. You know, in a way, what science has practiced over the past 500 years has come down to is it has been a relentless despiritualizing of the world until finally, you know, they tell you there is no soul, there are no spirits, that what you see is what you get. We have risen to the surface. Well, a shaman looking at a person with that kind of a mental map of things just pities them their simplistic stupidity. He says, you know, yeah. my God, you're, you're like a half-wit or something. Because everything interesting and complex you say doesn't even exist. I agree, but that doesn't mean that because no, we as a culture are now at a point where we do need to go back to this forgotten land. We need that feminine energy or that sense of sacredness of life and of all things and that sense of connectedness with the whole of the universe. Well, that's no reason to put down what we have learned, you know, because I think every culture, every civilization kind of drill in one direction for knowledge. And the Far East, for instance, with all of their meditation and all of their time spent in caves and no eating and and this kind of ordeal that they go through that puts them facing death even though they don't take psychedelic they get through that same experience with the kind of excruciating pain and whatever they invent you know to get there well they've drilled into that you know realm of the unconscious towards the source towards the no being the no self and they've done wonderful discoveries in that area but then, to, in order for them to go so far in that direction, they had to say, forget the world, this is all an illusion, I'm not interested with. Well, we took the other side of the coin. We said, forget religion, forget philosophy, forget even love and emotion. Who wants to deal with it? I want a microscope and I want to look at atoms. I want to look at viruses. And look what we've discovered that way. I mean, that's not to be all thrown into the water, you know. No, I there agree. There is a big danger to throw the baby with the bathwater. That's true, but also eventually you get into a situation of diminishing returns. For instance, you know, it was a great step forward for von Leeuwenhoek to grind his lenses and to see little animals cavorting in a drop of water. But, for instance, now, uh, ordinary science is going to Congress and saying, 
in order to take another step deeper into the understanding of matter, we want uh, $20 billion to create an instrument 17 miles in diameter that will take 30 years to build and that will allow us to e at last confront the, the uh, bottom quark or something like that. I heard these guys on NPR, probably some of you heard them, being challenged, particle physicists, being challenged by someone who said, well, you want America to commit, I think it was $50 billion to building the super collider, is that can you name a single spin-off from particle physics that has trickled down into the lives of ordinary people? And they were absolutely stymied. Well, uh I kind of go with Peter Russell's theory that, you know, perhaps from our technological culture we did get something, you know. First of all, none of us would be here if it was not for technology because today we have like close to five billion people on earth. That might be a curse, but that also might be, you know, do you be, want to be the one who is not born? I mean, uh... A tricky question. <laughs> <laughs> In, in that fact of life explosion, there is one thing that happened is that we do not have a conscious of ourselves as one planet, as one whole being. I mean, we, even with the technology of going to the moon, <coughs> through the physicality, we have a view of ourselves from the outside. I mean, to me, I look at it like maybe in the evolution of humanity, it's like uh, being seven years old, you know, all of a sudden you say, but hey, I am me, you know, I, I am somebody, and I can decide, you know, to say no or to say yes, but this is something there, there is an entity, and as a planet, maybe that's what we did when we went to the moon. And the Indians, you know, I go down to Sweat Lodge every week, and I participate with the Indian community down in San Pedro, so I'm trying to learn a bit the way they think. And I, a lot of things I, I enjoy very much, you know, but then other things, you know, I don't agree totally. For instance, with the moon thing, you know, they say, well, we've been to the moon many, many times before, and we go to the moon through the dream world. See, like, you went to the elves, but a lot of people go to the stars. I mean, there is a lot of other realities out there, and it's not the future, and it's not the past, it's just life, it's part of that but, but do you think that it's simply that there are a lot of realities? For instance, what puzzles me about these encounters with these elf things is the urgency from their side. You know, I could imagine just breaking into an elf ecology and seeing them busy making shoes and, you know, putting the blush on strawberries or whatever elves do. <laughs> But they seem intently focused on a project that has consequences in this world, and that puzzles me. I don't think history has been a waste of time. I think probably it's served its purpose, yeah. and that what we now have to do is take what we've learned. It's the prodigal son, I mentioned that, yeah. and now return to the archaic family with the ability to move to the moon and to etch microcircuitry and to define the protein coats of viruses and these fancy things that we can do. All that is good knowledge, but it has to be linked to a coherency of self that we somehow have gotten so strung out on this scientific descriptive binge that we forgot why we're doing it and yeah. what this is all for. The only thing I would say is that for people to hear us into this kind of, a, you know, rationality, I think it's good diplomacy not to put down the culture, you know, not to discard it. I mean, I got a sense sometimes that, you know, you just kind of discard it as, you know, a kind of a neurotic error of humanity or something. I think, you know, there is a acknowledging what it has done, acknowledging it as a step and, you know, kind of a saying, you know, there are good things that came out of it, but now we are reaching a kind of a crisis level, a, an apotheosis, you know, and now we are into a, a dark corridor where 
we have to make choice, we may have to change direction, we have to do, you know, something drastic because if not, it's going to be, you know, uh, uh, that is Well, the basis of my criticism of science is not the science that it does, which it does very well, but the metaphysical pontificating that it claims to be able to do based on nothing more than its assumption that all competitors are naive. I mean, science should not be telling us uh, what we should think about astrology because astrology is not a proper object for scientific judgment. In other words, science is simply one method of understanding the world. But the people who practice science think it's a meta-method, think that it is somehow the arbiter of truth, and that we are supposed to take any proposition and lay it at the feet of science, and it will uh, tell us whether it's kosher or not. And that means that the scientists are completely out of their domain and should be sent back to the workbench and the test tube and stay out of uh, the domain of metaphysics and philosophy, which is not properly their uh, area. That's part of the change where we don't value strictly the material world. We have to bring back the value to the sacred, the mystery, the, the whole other aspect of life. And if uh, as a culture we would change that, you know, so that everybody w would have a more balanced view of the universe, then the scientists would be automatically put back in their spot. Physics and metaphysics need to merge. Thank you. Everybody talks here like there is truth. There, been, there may be no truth. It may all be nonsense. When you go on and listen to Jenny's journey, it's, I get the impression sometimes you feel you're bringing truth back. I, how do you tell the difference between truth and nonsense? Or shit and yeah. shinola, I don't as we think normally... I don't, it worries me that it's entertaining, but I still don't feel there's necessarily any truth. Well, I don't know if you were at the lecture last night, but there was talk there about how one must not get clutchy about closure. There is no closure. There is no truth. You're quite right. But I, I mean, there isn't even a direction of truth. It may just all be nonsense. Well, if it's all nonsense, then we're in a hell of a fix. Well, uh, that's where we may be. Uh, Wittgenstein had a slightly different notion that I think is more serviceable here. He said, what we want to do is we want to make statements that are true enough. Now, there is a monkey concept. That's what we want. We want to say things which are true enough. That means serviceable in the circumstance in which they are being applied. It's and that's, a, yeah, or whatever, you know, if you're solving tensor equations of the third degree, then in that domain. But the idea, you see, it's so crazy to think that talking monkeys could get anywhere near truth. I mean, if, uh, do you think a sea urchin possesses the truth or a macaw? Well, then why you? And, and especially when you realize, you know, we do all this business in English and we're utterly naive about the limitations of language. Uh, you can't even under, I mean, take someone like uh, Derrida, for instance. Whatever the man's truth is, it can't even be exported into English without becoming gibberish. Because when you read him, you can't understand him. However, it's also looking at not only the limitations of language, but the potency of it. There's reason to believe that, believe that consciousness itself is invented out of language. Mm -hmm. When we take the pharaoh's children out of the jungle that haven't had the adoption of the abstraction into their life, that it's almost impossible to bring them to humanness, to, to being human. So language is maybe incredibly potent. And as you suggest with these, these elves, that you're talking about a medium of pure language. Or purer language. Purer. Yes, well, language, you know, if you were to look at this planet and seek the thumbprint of uh, a higher intelligence, God or the goddess or whatever, language is the thing to look at. I mean, this is the thing we do that is an incredible symmetry break with the rest of nature. Do you think a dog can tell the difference between those stairs and that, and that floor or the, or the rug and, the, and that or even the flowers and that? He sees it as a continuum that simply is a texture. Like we look at this rug, we don't identify that spot from the rest of it, we just simply say it's a rug. 
Well, an animal intelligence is, is suspended in the here and now. We have, uh, language seems to be a strategy for binding time. And notice that the entirety of evolutionary advance is a series of time-binding strategies. Uh, once you possess language, and especially once you possess writing, the past is not so past as it used to be. It hangs around, and we begin to create a database of experience larger than any community of living people could ever have. And the past stays with us. This is both a blessing and a curse. Notice that we have industrial cultures as a result of the accumulation of written language. That there's a simultaneousness between written language and agriculture, etc., and, and uh, industrial culture. Oh yeah, I, I don't have any problem with that. I, you know, somebody said language was created to lie. Yes, but it does it so elegantly and so well that the half-truths it tells are all that we can communicate. The truth cannot be said. It may even be possible to chart the evolution of a single individual from, you know, from a, 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 an infant all the way through his maturity as one who takes the journey from the right side of his brain into the left side of his brain, crossing a certain membrane there where he switches his dominance from right to left and then going full circle and then once again becoming quote-unquote spiritual by adopting and integrating the right once again. Well, yeah, these are all metaphors and analogies for a process which is essentially incomprehensible. There is no reason to expect reality to be rationally apprehendable. This is the, the basic fallacy that we so confidently assume the world is for us that we assume that we should also therefore be able to understand it. When in fact what we've done is just carved out a very limited domain of repetitious algorithms that don't have fatal consequences for us and then the rest of it lies in the realm of the great who knows. But, you know, since there's very little uh, percentage to be made out of that, people uh, prefer to keep their faces turned inward toward the campfire, not outward toward the immense darkness revealed by the campfire. And the bigger you build the campfire of metaphor, the more darkness you reveal outside of its domain. So uh, if ever there was an argument for open-endedness and, a, and a defocusing on closure, it would be the linguistic enterprise, I think. Well, we yeah. could just this one, we could, it may, you know, language uh, may be the carrier or the virus that in fact causes consciousness. There may not be any consciousness without the, uh, this infection of language. Yeah, well, I don't have any trouble with that. I mean, William Burroughs said language is a virus from outer space. Uh, and well, it may be. It does have, uh, you know, it self-replicates itself. It spreads through a population. Ideas mutate. They compete with each other. Ideas become extinct. New ideological forms that are more adaptable squeeze out other forms. I mean, the whole evolution of organic life may be simply a lower dimensional rehearsal for a kind of syntactical evolution that is going to go on in a domain that we can barely conceive of. Yeah, over. Yeah, for myself, I'm not so concerned with what the truth is, but what in, in fact works in one's life and how one uh, uses the word or uses the ideas to manifest in the reality that we're swimming through. Um, in light of that, I'm just wondering about the, the mushroom, morphogenetic fields, the uh, plant community in terms of allies uh, that one can become connected with as a, as a, as a uh, collective community that we're all participating in. Can you elaborate on that? Well, I've talked with Rupert a lot about this and um, sort of um, different things can be said. I mean, one way of thinking about what the psychedelic experience is is that um, psychoactive compounds amplify the morphogenetic field to the point where it becomes a potential object for inspection by the conscious mind. 
in the same way that we know right now that this room is filled with radio, VHF, UHF signals, but we also know that we would have to have a radio or a television set in order to tap into them. Uh, the morphogenetic field is ordinarily damped by experience, but becomes overwhelmingly present when we jack our neural neurophysiological receptors up to the point where these previously invisible influences become visible. The other thing in terms of the morphogenetic field theory and how it relates to psychedelics is to realize that when you take a plant, the plant takes you. And so, for instance, uh, the, one of the reasons I prefer shamanic hallucinogens to synthetics is that they are so much richer as databases because they have inside them all the people who've ever taken them. I mean, when you take psilocybin, you leave something behind in there that every other, every subsequent user of psilocybin will encounter. So you know the way Tibetans leave little cairns of rock when they cross high mountain passes? Well, this is what we're doing in the psychedelic experience. And really, the character of psilocybin is the cumulative superimposition of the character of the thousands and thousands of people over the millennia that have taken it, plus something else, its own unique nature. When you, when you take a, 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 a drug which induces an altered state like ketamine, for instance, ketamine is a, a drug that has not been around very long, hasn't been taken by millions of people, and is oddly empty. It's, the building is there, the architecture is there, but where are the hurrying secretaries, the water coolers, uh, the executives, the buzzing elevator, nothing, you know? It's empty real estate, it's for rent. And uh, if you want to move in, well then you can live there. But it's, uh, it's the difference between a modern office building and a 14th century Italian villa when you contrast uh, a, a modern synthetic with a, uh, a well-used shamanic organic. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. question. Uh, you bring so many different it's, it's in order to be a moving target. <laughs> that, that idea. I'd like the related experience. Well, first of all, I'd like to kind of get some input from if anybody else has anything to say on this matter. Um, a lot of times when I first take like five grams or something, I get this, this is kind of a simple thing, but it's a yawn. I'm wondering if, does anybody else get that yawn? Yeah. Yeah. No, the, yeah. the yawn is a physiological response to psilocybin that is, it's part of it. And so is the runny nose in the first hour. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, every drug has a spectrum of effects, and some are dependable and some are not. I mean, for instance, LSD, almost, you could almost say 100% of the people who take LSD, it dilates your eyes. That is an effect of LSD that it would be impossible to eliminate. But I wouldn't say 100% of the people who take LSD encounter the good Lord or something like that. That's a more selective effect. Okay, the uh, second part is, after I take five grams and after I get the buzzing sound in my ears, and then I, this last time I took it, um, was in a darkened room, laid on the bed, got naked, and just laid there. And um, for the first time what happened, usually I close my eyes and I'm able to get visions, kind of a passing vision, almost like a film going through my head. I'm wondering also, does anybody get it where it's coming from the right to the left, or from the left to the right, sort of a film coming across? Ah. <laughs> Parentology. Well, I, I think that, that the number of ways these things can present themselves is practically infinite. I mean, I've seen, I've had really weird experiences with information. For instance, uh, you know these flashers on buildings where the news goes by? I've had hallucinations where 
it became a textual hallucination. In other words, what I was seeing was an illuminated page of print, and then as I looked at it, every 50th letter would invert, and then suddenly every 20th, and then every 10th, and then every 5th, and I literally watch a page of text go from being readable to being gibberish, and then watch the meaning come through again in a loop. I mean, I think anything you can conceive of, it can do, and many things you can't conceive of. It, the beauty of individual perception, though. I mean, we're all individuals. We all have the, the gift of bringing our own ideas. But still, you have to be able to make general statements about it, or you would have to say that it's all and everything. One but of the but if one it was of exactly the exactly the same. It would be boring. Well, although how would you know, since you would never have any trip but your own? Right. One of the things that happens on psilocybin and on ayahuasca that really puzzles me that I just go back to again and again is you can be having these volleys of hallucination and then you can say to it, uh, Art Deco, and click, and suddenly there will be thousands of cigarette lighters, limousines, candy dishes, stuff rolling in black space in front of you thousands of these things perfectly exemplifying this very narrowly defined aesthetic domain. Italian Baroque, click, altarpieces, saints with their eyes rolled back, dripping gold, the whole thing. And so you say, boy, that is really strange. We click through aesthetic epochs like points on a dial, but then you can say to it, surprise me. In Baroque, not Ampere, not dynastic Egypt, not North American Indian, Maya or Fujiwara Japanese, but something never seen on this planet, but equally coherent as those other styles. And I always think, you know, my God, if I could just grab hold of this, I would be Yves Saint Laurent or Klimt <laughs> or somebody like that. And, and, uh, and then, you know, the most puzzling one of all is you can say to the mushroom, okay, enough of surprises, Art Deco, Italian Baroque, show me what you are for yourself. And then it's almost like, you know, there's a roll of drums and black curtains begin to rise and, and there's a cold air that sweeps through the room and you realize, you know, okay, you know, after about 45 seconds of that, you have to call a halt because you said you realize you know this thing was had clothed itself in so many levels of visual reassurance for you as a human being that the request that it reveal its true nature sets off a cascade headed in a truly appalling direction and usually you say okay that's enough of your true nature let's go back to dancing chipmunks and uh, little candies rolling in the dark yeah uh, do you foresee a uh, spot or a discrete thought in particular being uh, I don't know, locatable on the frequency spectrum of matter and energy such that it could drive the input of virtual reality so that you could communicate these kind of experiences uh, with headsets? You mean a machine that could be driven by the imagination? It's pretty... It's... Well, it raises a bunch of questions. I mean, the first question is, where is thought generated? The straight people believe that the brain makes thought, makes it. I think that the evidence is overwhelmingly against that, that that's as naive an approach to thought as I remember when I was little, I once tore apart a radio looking for little people inside of it. And... Uh, uh, you know, there are no little people inside the radio. The radio transduces vibrations that surround the planet and turns it into recognizable, uh, a recognizable experience. I, I don't believe thought can be located in the brain. I think the brain is an amplifier and an antenna for something that is everywhere. That the phrase, my thought, is a complete misnomer. You don't own thoughts. You don't generate them. All you do is tune 
into an ocean of thought in which we're embedded. This is the morphogenetic field about which so much shouting and arm waving is going on. The, to my mind, the proof of this position is the fact that the psychedelic experience unleashes visions in your head which you could not possibly have conceived of or imagined. It doesn't come from you. If we say that the content of the psychedelic experience comes from the self, then we have defined the self in such a way that it's unrecognizable to us. And if your self is unrecognizable to you, then it isn't yourself, you see. So uh, these things are proving that we participate in the world of mind, but that we don't generate it. Done. In that case, why can't we a common experience? What? Why are we all the same thing? It's a, a universal thought. Well, it's, that's like saying when we swim in the ocean, why don't we all see the same fish? Because the ocean is enormous. Because uh, we all enter it from different angles of attack. Would we experience the same thing? Yes, we would. And on psilocybin, one of the most stunning experiences you can have, if you wanted to make a believer out of you, is to sit with somebody and describe what you're seeing and agree that after three minutes you'll shut up and they'll start up and you discover that you just hand the baton on. They see what you see, you see what they see. This is confounding. You see, if we could do legal research with this stuff, we could overturn the paradigms of normal science in a number of areas within 18 months. I'm sure of it. I've seen it happen. I mean, I've seen states of group-mindedness that were so specific that there was no possibility that what was not happening was no shit, one-on-one, -on -one, real-time telepathy. Are there no countries in the world, maybe Amsterdam, where... Oh. Well, there are countries in the world where psychedelic research is, is tolerated, is the only way to put it, but it's in the hands of uh, scientists and people of uh, the imagination impaired uh, are largely in charge of these research programs. They're asking the wrong questions, you know? I mean, if you get a... Well, that's enough. They're asking the wrong questions. their new newsletter and what this newsletter says basically is that at uh, a recent convened meeting with the FDA uh, and a couple days after that with the National Institute for Drug Abuse they've worked out an arrangement now where MDMA at least and they say in another article here that possibly LSD testing will be uh, undertaken very seriously in the, in the near future and this is uh, going through MAPS and in conjoint uh, working with the FDA uh, to get certain types of permits uh, for the, the um, more intensive research that should be done in this field. There is, I think, uh, uh, the, the, the resistance to psychedelic research is beginning to weaken because an entire generation of people, people who were, you know, three and four years old in the 1960s, are now entering the medical research establishment as postdocs and so forth. And there is no good reason to be given for uh, not having a research program on psilocybin, for example. I mean, it was never a social problem. It, it is an, a valid object for scientific research. It's amazing to me the gutlessness of the scientific establishment on this matter. I mean, why you know, we hear about the omnipotence of the AMA and so forth and so on. Why has the scientific establishment lain down like a dog and let politicians set the research agenda for human research on psychedelics? The last time this happened was in the 14th century when the Pope and his cronies tried to make it impossible for people to dissect corpses because they didn't want people to uh, understand human anatomy. Well, in that situation, instead of swallowing it and putting up with it, 
medical students would steal bodies off the gallows and trail along behind armies to look at the freshly killed in order to create a, a compendious understanding of human anatomy. And, and they did. In the 20th century, science, which would have you believe that it's absolutely unbiased and it goes wherever curiosity seeks without prejudice or deference to anybody's social values or anything, is in fact a, a, a sycophantic slave to the agenda of these frightened politicians. So it's a real disgrace because, you know, I lived through the first psychedelic revolution and the news about LSD swept over the psychoanalytic community with the kind of force that the splitting of the atom swept over the physics community. And people involved in treating mental illness and studying brain function and mapping the brain said, this is amazing. A tool has been put into our hands that will throw open doorways in the practice of psychology we couldn't dream of. And instead, it was absolutely slammed shut. Imagine if Galileo had smashed his telescope after there was a little bit of whining from the Vatican. Had that happened, you know, we would still be living in a universe that, uh, defined by the Aristotelian stellar shells. Uh, a little courage on the part of these almighty scientists would go a long way toward overwhelming the the fearful strictures placed on by politicians who are trying to maintain a social equilibrium that is fairly odious anyway. Yeah? Yeah, I that kind of support of one thing you said and also a question which I hope will be organized enough for you to answer. Um, your remarks about the telepathy um, after some extremely intense boundary dissolution experiences with my wife, we have gotten to the point where using straight Michael Harner shamanic journeying techniques, we routinely have each other's visions. Um, I think I'm wondering if, if it isn't as much a matter of a learned response as anything else. No, I think it is a learned response. I think, uh, uh, you know, it, it requires psychedelics usually to plow the channel. But once you open the groove, then there are ways to reinforce it. And uh, one of the underrated uh, tools in this game is the power of acoustical driving and the power of sound to synergize uh, subtle, subtle chemical reactions. I mean, music is so compelling to us because it is essentially brain massage of some sort. And the pleasure we derive from music is, uh, at some level, a, a, a chemical pleasure. And I, I think, you know, trying to get to these places with yoga and drumming and fasting and all that is a pretty thankless task unless you clear the way with psychedelics and then you can really get somewhere. If you use psychedelics in combination with any of these traditional techniques for working in these areas, suddenly these traditional techniques, previously found to be maddeningly ineffective, become very, very powerful tools. So mantra with psychedelics works like magic. Uh, yoga breath control, drumming, visualization, simple prayer, it all works amazingly well in the presence of psychedelics and in the absence of psychedelics uh, entirely, it's a pretty frustrating get-go. And unfortunately, these non-psychedelic spiritual techniques are very quickly co-opted by the beady-eyed priests among us who then peddle it back to us with a menu of moral uh, uh, do's and don'ts stapled to the front of it, and that's entirely discouraging. Yeah, my other question is, kind of ties together some things you've mentioned during the course of the day. You mentioned way back when about no one else having the experiences that you have. Um, and so my question is to the whole issue of community and lifestyle. 
Um, the issue that I'm wrestling with right now, I think part of what I'm experiencing is my own drive for wholeness or insight or whatever. Part of it is perhaps the transcendental object on the event horizon, but what I'm wrestling with is how to follow my muse, how to live the life that's drawing me and at the same time able to function and pay my child support and not live in the woods. And if you could maybe give some guidance to me and some others of us sort of wrestling with that issue. Well, this is the tension between the transcendental and the mundane. What do you do about it? I don't know. I, I experience it as a real tension as well because I, you see, all these other um, spiritual techniques yoga, breath control, diet, you name it. The way you pursue those is with the pedal to the metal. In other words, full on, full court press. The way you relate to psychedelics is entirely the opposite, with your foot on the brakes all the time. They, the people who are using these other, these non-psychedelic techniques, are endlessly frustrated by the fact that they're not able to get where they want to go, I think. The people who use psychedelics spend a huge amount of time trying to keep from overshooting the goal and losing themselves in the incomprehensible who knows what. Uh, I think that if you have a genuine desire to leave us all behind and to go up on cold mountains, and to become a Taoist immortal, and to clothe yourself in a hair shirt and eat roots and contemplate the one forever, hey, there's nothing stopping you. It's just that that's an easy goal to enunciate when it's practically impossible. But it's in the presence of psychedelics, it is quite realizable. And then you have to think, but wait a minute, what about child support? What about, you know, my love of double cappuccino? What about, and then you say, well, I could leave this world. I could become an ascended master. But is that what I really wanted all along? And, and I think this is a tension. I mean, I feel it in myself. Uh, basically, I do what I do, and it's a chicken shit response to what I could be doing. Because what I could be doing is becoming utterly incomprehensible to everybody else on the planet and living in a tree somewhere and happily staring into space every waking minute. And, but I, I, I am not ready to kiss off my library, my children, my friends, my vices. And so people in our position have to balance these things and I think the real spiritual frontier lies in the community that we must uh, you know it's sort of the bodhisattvic ideal we must somehow carry everyone with us it's not about bailing out of history it's about sticking with it until we can end it for everybody but I'm not saying that's the only point of view if you want to go if you want to become an arhat I don't think there's anything stopping you. You see, once you get to the place where you find out by some set of peculiar circumstances about these things, psilocybin, DMT, and so forth, you have crossed a real frontier. This is not simply another spiritual technique for, you know, picayune advancement, uh, one more small step down the path. This is, in fact, this works. And maybe you never thought you would find something that works. Well, so the entire, you see, the attitude, it's, it's a naive attitude to quest. It's the attitude of the ingenue, the fool, the castaneda figure seeks. Once you reach the psychedelic plateau, the tool has been placed in your hands now. Now you have to figure out whether you were really serious about all this transcendental yearning that you indulged in when it seemed so far out of reach. Because now, you know, it's just a dose away. 
and we all come to that very differently. It's a different dilemma from the rest of the spiritual community. They just need more and more power. We need more and more insight and wisdom in order to know what to do with the fact that we can now achieve whatever we conceive of. So now is the moment to take a deep breath and decide where we really want to go with this stuff. Can I say something? Oh, sure. I just wanted to go back to you talking about the AMA. Um, I know I've heard Dr. Henry Wilde talk how they used LSD in treating autism. I knew a guy that was autistic and regained his hearing when his brother gave him LSD when he was 12 years old. Um, I believe the AMA does not want us to be healthy. They do not want us to have the tools. Um, there's a book called Toxic Psychology about how the psychopharmacology is actually making people brain dead. And I think, I mean, if you go back in time, the original healers who used plants and herbs were burned at the stake as being witches because of the medical schools they had back then and they were all men, they wouldn't let women in it even though they had been the original healers. And right now the FDA is doing this. They're trying to outlaw plants and herbs for healing, for anything. And this is vitamins, uh, food supplements, everything. And like I myself, I don't take pharmaceutical drugs because they make me sick. And the only thing I have to use for my PMS is hemp, and it's the only thing that works. And we all have to be somewhat political and make statements to people and enlighten them and educate them as to what's really going on because there's a whole world that could be opened up if we started using our plants and our herbs for healing again. Yeah, I yeah. agree. There's a, there's a lot of holistic um, centers opening up all over. I was just in one in Leavenworth, Washington, and it was really rewarding and wonderful to see a physician actually reaching out and searching other healers, a shaman and also uh, herbalists, everybody in her private practice. So it is coming in, and it's very slow, but it's, it's coming around. And faster and faster. I think that's why the FDA right now is trying to do away with it because it is growing. If you knew the legislation that is going on right now, they are raiding health food stores with guns and taking things out of there that like aloe vera products. And they're saying they've never been tested, we haven't approved it. And they're taking, I guarantee you, this is happening right now. And that's why you have to be aware and you have to educate people about it. But you see, at the same point, at the same time, they're granting the first INDs for psychedelic research in 30 years. So I pr instead of taking a paranoid view, I, you know, that they are against it and us, I, I just think that if you dissect these human institutions, what you find always are individuals and uh, usually these institutions are fraught with internal conflict mm -hmm. about what they're doing. There's a lot of fear, there's a lot of mistrust, and very few people go around rubbing their hands together and cackling over the fact that they are committing acts of pure evil. <laughs> Most people have some kind of in internal story that tells them that they are doing the very best they can. It's just that there are also a lot of jug-headed misconceptions about what the best we can actually means. This is why um, dialogue is so important, why free speech is such a powerful notion. Let all ideas compete on a level playing field and uh, the, the, the correct points of view, I think, will will emerge eventually. Well, that's why we need people like you out there. <laughs> uh, backing up a little bit to uh, the journeys to Elfdom and other places, M most semantic journeys seem to be almost, e even when they're began, begun as a, a, a group thing, end up being a solitary journey of, of your own, whether you're the octopus with the colors displaying yourself and you're out there. It very rarely do you hear of people journeying with another mind being, not, not, not the body being, but a, a mind being. So in these journeys, whether you're in an elf realm or another realm, is, is there a reading between these other entities and you 
in your journey to their world or their space, I mean, can, is there a communication at all? And also, can you go with somebody from this realm out there, but on a mind plane, or as, as you described, the octopus type thing, where you're communicating not with words or dictionary? Well, it's hard to say. You know, Plotinus, who was a Neoplatonic philosopher, he described the mystical experience of as the flight of the alone to the alone. And there certainly is an element in, in the psychedelic thing of it being so large a dimension that when you go into it, you not only see things that you have never seen before, you see and not only do you see things that no one else has seen before, but you see things which no one else will ever see again. So I, I tend to, and this is just my personal preference, and I'm a double Scorpio and a number of different things that push me in this direction, but I really like to do the deep work alone and then try to bring it back, and this is the proper domain for sharing and community. We know that the psychedelic, you know, that behind five grams of psilocybin lies a psychedelic world, but how can we create a psychedelic world here and now on Zip? And the answer is by becoming ever more psychedelic ourselves. And so it's a tremendous empowerment for eccentricity. And basically my whole career is based on eccentricity. One of the most fearful questions to come my way is when I'm riding on airplanes to some situation like this and someone sits down beside me and says, so what do you do? And I usually, I, tr I try to escape. I say, and this is always a horribly weak thing, I say, oh, I write books. And then they say, oh, well, what do you write books about? And then we move into the realm of pure lie. I usually say, travel. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So, it, you know, I think if you have, uh, I mean, to return to your question, if you have an extraordinary heart connection with someone, you can voyage together a certain distance. But this is a unique, kind of thing, and uh, probably many a relationship has experienced unnecessary strain because somebody thought they had that kind of connection, and then when they got out into the incoming psychic surf, they discovered one person forgot their tanks uh, back on the beach. Yeah. I, mean, I, I can clarify, you said earlier, and I heard you say before, that behind five milligrams of one thing and 500 uh, of another, there is a little green elf or something else. Is that a consistent picture for you? Not that the experience would not be, be new in terms of the communication, but is, is that consistent? Do you, do you yourself find that same image or that same level of, of uh, mushroom at that point? But then secondly, do in, in terms of the people that, that you communicate with who do measured quantities and who do it similarly, say uh, Rupert Sheldrick, is, do, does, have you have other people, have other individuals communicated that they see those same type of creatures, for lack of a better word? You hear them saying about the urgency of your coming there and being there, and that's a big thing. I feel that it's, it's an important thing. So once you're there, I mean, and, and you have to have a community. I mean, you're looking for a common denominator of communication there and the urgency of finding something there. I mean, that's kind of, you know, also I'd like to find out. Well, I mean, the answer is, you know, if you send 10 people to Paris and then you interview them about their experience of Paris, you know, one of them stayed with the wife of the prime minister, somebody else stayed in a bordello on the wrong side of town, their notions of Paris are rather different. However, if you interview them closely enough, you can tell that this must have been the same place in some sense. I mean, for me, the DMT experience is remarkably consistent. It always is this dome, underground, 
filled with these self-transforming elf machine creatures and then when I talk to other people and interview them about it what I've come away with is the notion that an archetype is like a series of concentric circles and to the degree that you reach the center of the circle the accounts become more and more consistent for instance and in thinking along those lines what I've come to see about for instance DMT is that it has an archetype and the archetype is and God knows why the circus DMT <laughs> is the archetype of the circus so you give it to someone who is not psychedelically sophisticated and you give them a low dose then they come back then you say what was it like this is a direct quote from a woman a couple of years ago she said it was the saddest carnival I've ever been to she said all the rides were closed nobody was there there were just gum wrappers blowing between boarded up tents I said interesting so then give it to someone else and they said it was full of clowns and I said you mean elves he said no just clowns and as the dose rises the familiarity of the image is stripped away and it migrates more and more toward this thing behind the mask well now if you think of the circus it is an interesting archetype first of all three rings in constant activity uh, and it's a wonderful thing for children children love the circus because there's light and color and music and animals and you know clowns but then there's also a side to it which children don't see I mean you lift your eyes from the center ring and there is Eros in the form of the beautiful blonde woman in the tiny spangled costume who works without nets hanging by her teeth far above the center ring and t twisted into this erotic image is death because she works without nets the whole point of her performance is the fact that she could uh, fall and be killed well then there's yet another aspect to this circus archetype which is away from the lady in the spangled costume and the clowns climbing out of their little cars and the powdered elephants of many colors are the sideshows that snake off into the darkness the two-headed lady the goat boy and uh, the thing in the bottle they're all there too to be looked at so it's this incredibly rich amalgam of light color humor childhood memories cotton candy joy eros death the thing in the bottle the wild animals so forth and so on and as you make your way toward it it, it different layers fall away find similar but different consistencies with LSD and with uh, psilocybin that you could make as clear as the consistency that you find with the DMT oh yeah I think that see one of the great confusions about psychedelics is that they're all the same like in some textbooks if you look up psilocybin it will say a hallucinogen derived from fungi which causes LSD type hallucinations this is nonsense this just simply means that LSD arrived first on the workbench of Western civilization so everything is referent back to it if you're going to take these things you need to take enough that you can tell the difference and at low doses all psychedelics are the same it's just the experience of agitation and psychic inner turmoil it's sort of like speed you know but as the doses increase you begin to hit the bifurcation point and uh, these things have distinct personalities for instance uh, DMT the elf playroom reception area that seems to define it the amazing thing about psilocybin and its distinguishing characteristic is uh, it speaks it speaks in English to you it conversationally approaches you and you 
uh, talk to it in your mind. I mean, this is an amazing thing. If you've never experienced it, there's something out there for you. Well, Try that, it. That's, that's what, I, what was behind asking you that question, because I don't have any DMT experience. I've never taken, I've taken uh, psilocybin just in the form of, of the mushrooms themselves mm -hmm. in a botanical garden. And I don't have much other experience. And what happened was quite transformational in the long term because it put me in touch with the plant world. But not in a, I didn't close my eyes. I had no other realm. It was the realm that was there in the garden. A communication, well, you said it last night, with the mind of that botanical area. The, the mind of that plant world that was there. It talked to me, I wouldn't, I guess I, I, it got translated into English, but it was kind of saying everybody should have very close to them a realm like this to be in, and people would be okay. Do everything you can to support that. <laughs> That's the message. And, and for instance, you know, the mushroom has a personality, and like all personalities, it excludes some things and includes others. The, the mushroom personality is a radically eccentric personality. The mushroom talks about transforming the planet. It says, you know, I, I come from a distant part of the galaxy. I have 500 million years of galactic history in my data banks. I have seen 50,000 worlds come into existence and pass out of existence. I've seen ships the size of Australia depart for Andromeda. I've seen this, I've seen that, and it's willing to show you the newsreels of it. That kind of a, and it says, your world is ending. Put your furry paw into my hand, and together we will march out to the stars. It's this, dun, dun, ba, da. Well, so then, you, you take a, a compound or a, or a, a, a shamanic hallucinogen like ayahuasca. Chemically, this is very, very similar to DMT. Experientially, it could hardly be more different. It, ayahuasca does not show you images of enormous machines in orbit around alien planets and that sort of thing. Ayahuasca, first of all, it doesn't speak. It shows. It, you become like the eye of a camera flying through a world. And what it shows you, it's much more feminine. It shows you water flowing over the land. It shows you plant life growing and dying. It shows you the movement of glaciers over the surface of the land. It shows you people burying their dead. It shows you archaic civilizations. It shows you women nursing their children. It shows you meat. It shows you the stuff of this world on every level. And, and it moves you to tears. I mean, it's emotive. It's not about our cosmic destiny out there in the starry blackness. It's about coming to terms with the earth and our past and each other. And you say, you know, these things, these are personalities, these are visions. And the idea is to fuse all of this into a single unitary perception that does honor to all and uh, uh, limits none. Back here. able to uh, communicate with all types of plant life and they see that each plant life has a beautiful message to bring and they did talk about the mushrooms and saying that it does enhance the human immune system could you talk a little about that well yes this is true uh, you probably all know or, or may have heard of what's called Rishi Gen or Ganoderma lucidum this is a mushroom a Chinese mushroom that definitely stimulates the immune system and many fungi probably have uh, have this quality because these higher fungi the basidiomycetes have enough of a trace of their evolutionary death to more uh, primitive fungi the kind that cause candida and and uh, vaginal fungus and stuff like that the, the, the undifferentiated fungi that the, the immune system recognizes this as a potential uh, 
stimulant and, and responds to it. So this is definitely uh, true. Yeah. I just got this notion uh, that maybe the good old incompleteness there would explain the absence of the self when we dive into it, you know, and I thought maybe you'd get a quick answer from, or even a long answer, about which is more real than the self and the other, or is the self the other, the, the one? No, the self is the other. Right. That, that's, the, that's what I've come away. The, the self is the other. And assimilating the implications of that takes a lifetime. Uh, uh, we have within us the very thing that we're seeking, you know. It's like the Jungian fairy tale of the guy who leaves home and searches the world for enlightenment and has all these adventures and finally concludes that it is not to be found and returns to his home and uh, rebuilds the hearth and discovers beneath the hearth the thing that he had sought in all the wrong places. I mean, it is, uh, it is within. It is a recurso. Uh, what we are looking for is within us. It's our own inner riches. This is why psychedelics are such a powerful antidote to capitalism because they teach you that you are not a wannabe. You are where it's at. And nobody should allow you or sell you a different point of view to make you think you're going to be complete when you get a Maserati or a Rembrandt or something like that. All that is just the detritus of the physical world. Would, would you say we're cycling at the same rate between self and other? Or, or if there is such a thing that everyone's doing it? Well, I think that if we could really follow ourselves into dream every evening with full consciousness, that we would discover that we touch the philosopher's stone at least once every 24 hours. It's just that we return down the river of forgetting, let's say, you know, and every morning we emerge from spending time with the other as self, and then we're inserted back into the fiction of our three-dimensional existence and our individuality. I know that the tapers are getting antsy. We need to break for uh, just a few minutes to have tea and stretch. Don't forget your question. We'll come back and hammer on this a little more. Hey, uh, why don't we pull together? While we're doing that, I wanted to call your attention to uh, a new publication on your newsstand, which is Psychedelic Illuminations. Uh, Ron Piper and a number of his associates have uh, gotten this together. In this issue, there happens to be an article or an interview with yours truly. I don't know if there's anything in it we didn't cover today, but psychedelic publication is rare enough anyway. So. Uh, called Psychedelic Illuminations. This is issue three of volume one. It's still not too late to be the first on your block to uh, subscribe to this publication, so watch for it. This is Ron. If you want to talk to him, I'm sure he can arrange for you to have more involvement with it. Okay, so we're into the uh, final round here. Uh, is there anybody who's really, oh, there they are, the burning people, yes. Well, I, I, you know, last night you mentioned briefly about the Christ, 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 I didn't quite get it, and I just wondered if you would clarify, because it bothered me a lot, and I thought I couldn't quite see, I mean, democracy is limited, but um, that doesn't mean you throw it out, I didn't, you know, it's always limited, but it's still valuable for what it does, perhaps, so I wanted to explain better how you um, well, no, defend I, it or whatever. I wasn't advocating getting rid of democracy. What I was suggesting was that we don't really have democracy because we don't have an ideologically level playing field because special interest groups are able to spend so much money to influence opinion that what we really have is an, an oligarchy of special interest groups that is very skillfully able to manipulate the general population into taking up positions that they would not naturally incline themselves 
toward. So if you're serious about having a democracy, then you have to somehow uh, curtail the incredibly sophisticated efforts to skew the democratic dialogue to favor one or another special interest groups that are buying their way into the dialogue. I thought you were throwing the concept out because you mentioned about, oh, there's one person, one vote. No, thing. didn't I? Uh, I, do. I mean, I agree it's an ideal more than a reality. You know, no, you know. I think democracy, I'm a thoroughgoing Democrat. I think democracy is, is almost a biologically obvious way of organizing ourselves. I mean, one person, one vote. What I was knocking is that behind democracy lurks the idea of the citizen and that's the idea that we're all exactly alike and that's preposterous and an unnecessary fiction to the practice of democracy we are not all alike in our abilities in the wealth we command so forth and so on so for purposes of governing ourselves we give each person a say but we shouldn't then extrapolate that uniformity into the idea that we are in fact uniform. We are not. You see, democracy of that sort, based on the modern concept of the citizen, has arisen in the wake of the invention of printing. And uh, printing, a number of ideas spun off from printing that McLuhan was the only person to really correctly identify what they were and what their effects were. One is the idea of interchangeable parts, because print is a system of interchangeable parts. It, once you establish a font, every lowercase e looks like every other lowercase e. Uh, what we are is more like, more analogous to what you deal with in manuscript, where every E is sort of like every other E, but it contains individual variations imparted by the fact that it was drawn by a human hand at a given moment. We want to, we want to express our political will through a system of equality but we don't want to do damage to our individual uniqueness. And the point I was trying to get at last night is the concept of the citizen, it does erode the idea of our uniqueness to some degree. Yeah. You crafted an elegant response that basically said that the first molecule was pure, and every mutation after that became more complex. I'd like your comments on the rift that they found in Western Canada in recent scientific times. It's become a mother load of uh, soft, uh, I don't know what the word is, uh, of mammals, not mammals, but uh, sea, sea creatures that are ex incredibly more complex than anything found on the planet today which is strongly suggests to the scientific community that we are devolving rather than evolving. Well, uh, you're referring to the Burgess Shale and what's his name's book, Wonderful Life, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I sort of differ with your interpretation of it. It wasn't that these things were more complex than any life forms on the earth today. It was that they represented a large number of phyla, none of which exist on the earth today. So the point that was being made by the paleontologists is apparently we started out with many different phyla and then it narrowed at some point into just a few phyla which then re-radiated out into all the forms we possess today. Uh, so I think um, other people have brought this up and it's a troubling example because it tends to throw a railroad tie against the onrushing of my rhetorical freight train, but that's the name of the game, folks. Um, it probably is true that at, at an early point in the evolution of life, 
I mean, it's obviously now established, there were these many, many different phyla, and for unknown reasons, certain phyla became extinct, and then the, uh, the, what w the phyla which were left radiated and filled all the abandoned niches uh, that had previously been occupied by these now extinct organisms. But nevertheless, we have to look at this question of, for reasons unknown, they became extinct. Why did some phyla survive and others not? It would be inconsistent with the theory of evolution to suggest that this happened entirely by chance. There must have been some adaptive advantage possessed by the phyla that made it through whatever these narrow evolutionary necks were, and then the phyla which survived these climatological crises or whatever they are, radiated into an incredible number of complex forms that nevertheless could be traced to a small number of earlier uh, phyla. Uh, a more, in line with your, the thrust of your argument, uh, a more difficult to answer objection that I don't know why I'm telling you this because it erodes my own position, but I was preaching this, the world complexifies through time wrath at Esalen one time and a guy was staying with me there who was a, a professional Russian translator. He was a Russian and a linguist. And he said, you know, there's a major exception to your rule that all phenomena complexify through time, and, and that is language. He said as we go back into the past, languages become richer. And I I am still puzzling over this. I don't think it's an inherent property of language. I think it's because as we go back into the past, languages become more and more localized. And local variations develop in small, confined geographical areas. So that then when you pour all these languages together, there tends to be a certain uh, uh, leveling, and this probably uh, results in a uh, in a general uh, fall in the total number of words being used in a language. In other words, if in Canada they call a windshield a windscreen, and in England they call it something else. Well then, as long as Canada, England, and the U.S. don't communicate, we have three words for windshield. But if these three cultures communicate frequently and deeply, probably a couple of these words will become obsolete or colloquial, and one term will dominate. So uh, language is not evolving uh, uh, in a vacuum. You have to look at the effects of modern transportation, migrations of people, and that sort of thing. I agree that this is not, this complexification through time thing has the characteristic of a general tendency, but it's not an ironclad uh, natural law. We can see that now, for instance, uh, communism in the Soviet Union acted as a deep freeze for traditional cultures. Wonderful traditional cultures exist out on the steppes of Central Asia in Kyrgyzia, Turkmenistan, uh, Nagorno-Badakshanskaya, and these places. Well, these wonderful traditional cultures are probably now all trading in their colorful garb, vocabularies, and technologies for transistor radio subscriptions to Time Magazine and Der Spiegel, and generally lining up with the the global leveling of culture that we see in the 20th century. So these are complex issues, and you're, you're right, it isn't entirely straightforward. Do you mean the one to Prague or the one to Italy? <laughs> well, well, I, I went to Prague to the ITA conference, the International Transpersonal Association conference in June, and uh, 
I had never realized till I went there. It was my second trip to Czechoslovakia. But, you know, as children, we grew up with a wonderful story of an emerald green country uh, farmed by happy munchkins and ruled from a beautiful capital city built around a splendiferous palace presided over by a wizard. And I realized Czechoslovakia is Oz for grown-ups. And uh, it, the morphogenetic field of the place is such that it might be a place we should all consider as a good venue for an archaic revival. I think Prague in the 90s could be what Paris in the 20s was. It is, after all, the capital of old Bohemia. You may not know why we are called Bohemians. You don't have to have a Slavic gene in your entire family tree and can claim yourself as a Bohemian. It's because Bohemia stood for individual freedom, eccentricity, the magical art, the practice of the art, and uh, the, a, a science which more gently approached the union of spirit and matter. And this whole al potential alchemical civilization based around Prague was destroyed by the Thirty Years' War. If you're interested in all this, you should read Frances Yates' book, The Rosicrucian Enlightenment, in which she shows that at a certain point in Western history, there was the possibility of a Protestant alchemical revival in Central Europe that was uh, bungled by a series of diplomatic and cultural misunderstandings and led instead to the Thirty Years' War, which then if, you know, if, if, before the Thirty Years' War, Europe was thoroughly medieval in its character, really. And at the end of the Thirty Years' War, modernity was launched. I mean, the absolute power of kings had been replaced by parliaments and people. And Prague, when the people who won the Thirty Years' War got down to redrawing the maps of Europe, they made sure that Prague fell on the wrong side of the language line and became a place that spoke a language spoken nowhere else in Europe, Czech, instead of the language that had been spoken there before the Thirty Years' War by the court, which was Italian. So it's a whole lost episode in Western history that uh, not too many people know about, but we could all return to our Bohemian roots and create a community under the gentle aegis of Václav Havel and similar uh, uh, philosophically right-thinking people that might be a window of opportunity. We, you know, it's very important when you're trying to make social change that you find the proper resting place for your, your fulcrum or a proper fulcrum for your lever and the best place is outside the system that you're trying to move. And if we're serious about carrying on a major critique of American society, Prague might be an excellent place from which to do it, especially if by some nightmarish fluke of fate uh, the knotheads currently in power are able to hang on. Sorry for that brief foray into politics. That, that's what Richard was trying to bait me into, yeah. California, several miles above where we are today. In a place called Decker Canyon, there's a lost civilization with walls that surround the city and artifacts carved into the mountains that could not have possibly been from the Indians, the technology that they believe was a part of this lost civilization was from another world. Could you comment on what your feelings are in terms of our planet being colonized by extraterrestrials in terms of Atlantis and Lemuria or the land of moon? Yeah, I can. I'm not sure how much comfort it will give you. Um, It seems to me an underwhelming proposition. 
In other words, if this happened, where is the evidence? Uh, you know, there have been fabulous civilizations existing in the past, but their artifacts, their buildings, their earthworks are available to be visited and seen. It seems to me, you know, in trying to build models, I try to follow Occam's razor. You all know what Occam's razor is? Hypotheses should not be multiplied without necessity. And I just find the, the lost continent thing um, an unnecessary hypothesis. I think there are lost civilizations, but I think we do a grave injustice to our dilemma and our accomplishment by thinking that anybody ever stood in this position before. To me, you see, there's an impulse that's very old in the Western mind to, um, and strangely enough, I trade on it to some degree. It's called the nostalgia for paradise. And it's that we are always looking back to a lost golden age. And I think there was a lost golden age on the plains of Africa 15 to 20,000 years ago. I discussed it this morning. But I don't think high technology has ever existed before on this planet. Well, there's just no evidence of it. And the Atlantean and people and the enthusiasts of Mur, Mur, Mu and Lemuria are always trying to fiddle with the date and say, you know, the Great Pyramid is 25,000 years old and there's a ruin on the Nazca Plain that's 50,000 years old. This is, first of all, the evidence is absolutely unconvincing. And second of all, the miracle is not how old the breakout into language and technology is, but how recent it I, is. I agree with you. I think that... Um, you know, if you were to go scuba diving off of Bermuda and the Bimini Islands, you would find what many people believe are artifacts from Atlantis. You can hike in Decker Canyon and most of what is to be found is on the water because of the shift in the continental plates 10,000 years ago or more. But many people believe that the UFO involvement in that civilization um, is still very active today. I know someone who, I believe you met last night, Robert Stanley from Munichus Magazine. He takes people on these expeditions in Deco Canyon. He took somebody at the beginning of the summer and a raw film was shot. The person was from the East Coast, I believe in Boston, and he based on the development of the film. He just forgot about it and he decided, okay, I might as well get this developed. And sure enough, hovering in the distance over this part of the canyon were 12 saucers. And it's a pretty obvious picture. I saw it last night for the first time. And I'm just curious because I think that a lot of us don't really deal with a lot of the information that's coming out right now because it's overwhelming. You know, it's almost like, wow. Well, I, I, I am prepared to be convinced, but I'm not willing to buy in without a fair amount of evidence. As far as UFOs are concerned, um, I've thought a lot about it, I've seen them far away, up close, and it's not what people say it is. And the, the problem, there, there are two phenomena, the UFO, who knows what that is, and then the UFO community, and my God, these people are much weirder than UFOs, I mean, they, the, well, the whole slew of them. And the whole problem with the UFO community is apparently these people have never heard about the rules of evidence. I mean, they're just full of revelation after revelation with absolutely zip to back it up. There are so many, I mean, you look at these UFO magazines. Well, do you want to believe Master Chen Thuk of the Nabungi system? Or do you want to go with the, the Billy Myers crowd? or? What's coming out of Brazil? Uh, I think Jacques Vallée in one of his books estimated that if you don't believe UFOs only appear where there are witnesses, 
and uh, take the number of sightings seen by people and extrapolate that by the area of the surface of the Earth, you have to conclude that UFOs are coming and going from this planet at a rate of 12,000 a month. Well, my God, what kind of extraterrestrial contact is this that 12,000 a month for 50 years and never a definitive piece of evidence? I was talking to one of the researchers on the fetal abduction thing. I was all excited. He said to me, you know, I've talked to 500 women who claim uh, surgical removal of fetuses. And he said, and you know, the amazing thing, there's not a single uh, uh, sign of physical invasion of these women's bodies. And I said, well, Dr. X, doesn't this suggest something to you? And he said, yeah, advanced surgical techniques of which we have no knowledge. I said, well, yeah, but doesn't it, I mean, give me a break. So I think they have to operate in the light of the same evidence as everybody else. And their problem is that they claim to know too much. They're just willing to tell you, you know, 125,000 years ago they arrived to grow sweet peas and then 100,000 years ago the project changed and the 11th planet did something. Too much, too much data. It's too Jack Armstrong-ish. Do you believe our government has the technology to travel in ships to other stars? Do you think we're doing that today or do you think that's our future? No, I don't think we're doing that today. I mean, this is a, we have a government that can't uh, knock off uh, a loudmouth in Baghdad, let alone travel to other stars. So you believe our space program Pardon me? Our space program is limited to what NASA tells us is the reality of what's going on, and that's basically, you don't think it's like an underground or a whole network of societies and organizations within our government that are involved in research and technology. Well, obviously, there is a black portion of the government where research goes on and probably fairly kinky things are carried out. But these people are no different from us. I mean, some of them may be here today. And I don't mean cops. I mean, you know, there may be NASA scientists here today that we are not so different from the people we're talking about. Human beings cannot keep a secret you may bank on it and so the idea that you know somebody possesses a technology thousands of years in advance of us i mean then when you actually tear the lid off some of these government black operations you don't find super scientists and brilliant minds you find people like gordon liddy and john dean and you know half-wit clowns uh seem to lie behind most of this I, I believe that no, I am not a conspiracy person. I believe that nobody is in control and that the people who seek control are the most misguided of all and that there's a great deal more than we don't know than we do know. And, uh, you know, I would love to be convinced that something really far out were happening but it just always seems to come apart in your hands. These are, I, I consider stuff like the UFO phenomenon as popularly um, commercially available UFO beliefs as basically viruses of language, diseases of understanding. If you could teach people about the laws of evidence and how you build a case and stuff like that, then people wouldn't be troubled by this. The same fuzzy thinking that permits people to believe in UFOs permits them to believe in the imminent uh, expectation of the second coming or, you know, the face of Christ appearing on tortillas and all of this stuff. Terrence, may, may I stop here for a second? Uh, is there a lot of people still with questions? Because they still have a lot of time, well, at least till 6 o'clock supposedly. Um, can I have a show of hands? If, okay, there's a few more because we want to sort of limit the questions to one question per person and, and sort of one rebuttal from that so that everybody can get a fair share before we uh, make a final. Yeah. Is this a gentle hint to stop raving about UFOs? You just want to make sure you're raving about UFOs and just want to hear more about it. Oh, I see. 
Well, I'll, I say to the UFO people the same thing, you know, what can you show us? Drag it forth. Everything has to be judged on the same field. It, it, if you've got something, spill it. But to claim, you know, as I, I don't want to use names here, but stories like, well, we met the UFOs and they gave us a message from mankind, but when we got back to our car, our tape recorder had miraculously erased itself. <laughs> well, then be quiet. Don't tell anybody this. Don't you understand how lame that sounds to the doubter? It's, it's not the believer you have to convince. They're a pushover. What are you going to do about your skeptics? That's the problem. Well, you want me to tell you a story? Yeah. I was in the Amazon. Um, I was in a state of considerable psychic turmoil. And uh, I sat up all night. This is told, by the way, in the book, True Hallucinations, which will be published next year. And uh, at dawn, I looked across this lake, and there was a thin line of clouds on the horizon. And... Uh, I watched this line of clouds and they were and then suddenly I noticed that they were turning in place like a pencil spinning on its axis in one place and then the clouds uh, this line of clouds broke apart into four perfectly identical lenticular clouds and then the lenticular the four lenticular clouds merged into two lenticular clouds and then the two merged into one and as they merged into one i i heard the the whee 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 sound of hollywood science fiction flying saucers and i realized this thing was coming toward me across the lake and it was absolutely convincing it was a flying saucer the real thing and and i i was absolutely convinced that it was going to take me at that moment and as it passed over only about 200 feet above my head I could see it clearly enough that I could see rivets on its underside I could see its running lights I could see it but you know what I saw I saw the end cap of a 1932 model Hoover vacuum cleaner. It was the very same flying saucer that George Adamski suspended from a piece of mylar fishing line in 1953 and photographed in his garage one of the most famous UFO hoaxes of all time. I saw it a diameter of 40 feet over the Amazon basin and I knew what I was looking at. It was uh, more disturbing than if it had been a ship from Zeta Reticuli because it had built-in cognitive dissonance. Uh, what? If it's a very short story. <laughs> Driving a car underneath the thing, which 
Well, see, I, I believe you completely. I don't have any problem with that. It's simply an enormous leap to say that that was a craft from another star. It's much better to just say it's a who knows what it is. The world is full of weird stuff. It, just briefly, here's my best theory on flying saucers and a whole bunch of other stuff. This tries to solve all problems of this sort simultaneously. The transcendental object at the end of time, let's drag it in here, and let's imagine that it is like those mirrored balls that they hang in discos above the bar and spin. So then I think that Definitely there is a forward movement of causal necessity which propels us from the past into the present on into the future. But that there is also, and necessary to account for precognitive visions and stuff like that which happen all the time, a flow of information from the future into the past. And the transcendental object at the end of time is casting reflections of itself backward into the past and if you are struck whatever that means by one of these scintillas from the transcendental object at the end of time then you begin to cure and teach and if you really got a good hit possibly raise the dead I mean I'm not sure how far it can go now also these these images of the transcendental object at the end of time haunt the skies of this planet in the form of spinning vortices of contradiction. This is what Jung said. He said, you know, the UFO is an image of the self. And I don't mean the little self. I mean the collective self of humanity. So a story like Jim's story is, I have no problem with it. I take it as true. It's the people who say, you know, and they revealed the nature of the fall of Atlantis and the world plan. Then it's too much because it's coming through human interpretation. The horrible thing about the UFO people who claim contact is that the, the aliens they present to us are so incredibly mundane. So much more mundane than what you would encounter on a DMT flash <laughs> that they're just like the neighbors next door. Uh, I think that, you know, alien intelligence, the trick is not to find it, but to recognize it when it's in front of you. Intel intelligence is a very slippery concept. Sometimes we can't even identify it in the person sitting next to us on the bus. So how can you expect to identify the intelligence of an alien? It, it just seems incredibly unlikely to me. I think the world is a lot stranger than we suppose without evoking benevolent aliens who prefer vegetarian diets and who come from the stars. I mean, why do they so fit our preconception of what they would be? I mean, silvery humanoids, uh, alien intelligence and alien life, when and if you meet it, you'll know you're in the presence of the real thing because you'll be barely able to wrap your mind around it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm basically in agreement with you. I was kind of pondering over the idea of my, of my earlier question about well, if we perceive these as being aliens, that's one thing. But what happens if, in fact, these humanoid creatures that we're defining are us traveling back through time and, and being able to materialize our, through, our t through the, the future technology? Then we're talking about something different. I'm not saying that this is true. This is only you know, part of my own you know, speculation. Well, it's an attractive that, idea. Yeah, it it attractive, raises exactly. problems, as I'm sure you're aware, sure. the grandfather paradox and so forth and so on. Uh, but it, it's a possibility. I think it's more likely that these are emissaries from the land of the dead yeah. than from the Pleiades. Right. And that 
it, since they speak English, since they look humanoid, since they seem to care about us and our technologies and so forth, they seem remarkably human. Well, maybe they're concerned about their own state of well-being. Maybe somehow it's related to to the the you know what's going on here now and what the outcome is going to be. Maybe that's going to somehow affect the way they are. You know, I mean, we've seen it in in Star Trek. You know, I mean, the idea is no, the idea is of of you know people coming back from the future to to you know, I mean, there is a paradox obviously involved in this, so it is it, it's a lot of our imagination at work. But the same ten, at the, at the same, in the same ideas, you know, maybe there is a certain sense of reality about it. Maybe there is. Maybe there is. It could you know, be a holographic a projection out of the guy in mind. Yeah. It could be, uh, you know, a race of intelligent saurians that rose and fell before the asteroid impact that wiped out the dinosaur. It could be all and everything. The trick is to try and get some kind of evidentiary hold on it. Yeah. Parents, uh, this is a nut and bolt question. Um, but first I'd like to preface it by saying that I haven't used psychedelics in 20 years and uh, haven't used marijuana in seven and am, have been considering a uh, return to the use of psychedelics. And um, when I stopped, the last experience which I had, it wasn't a terrifying experience and it wasn't a bad trip. It was um, similar, it presents similar insights that I have heard you mention and speak of. But there were times in which my psychedelic use um, left me uh, rather shaken and terrified. Um, dealing with um, fear of death and crossing over the line. Though I have to say that my very first psychedelic experience was one which contained a death and rebirth experience. So I don't know why after that, but that's the nature of fear, I suppose. Um, so the question is, it's a nut and bolt question, it's um, uh, how does one proceed with the use of psychedelics after a long absence from it and uh, not make the mistakes and not run into the walls um, that I occasionally ran into and or, and or deal with them, get around them, um, so forth and so on. Well, I think the best protection against unpleasant experiences on psychedelics is to do it with care and attention in environments that are safe and low on sensory input. In other words, you don't take it and go to a crowded singles bar or even a rock and roll concert. I mean, if you have to combine psychedelics with rock and roll, do it with low doses. No, I, I took it uh, in the desert and in the mountains. Well, this is the way to do it. It isn't always going to be ecstatic, but it's, al it's almost always guaranteed to be educational. There's no way you can seal yourself off from shock, because shock may be what you need. Uh, but you can... attention to it. I mean, fasting, going into it, cleaning yourself up, creating a safe space, not going to it if you've just been highly agitated by some emotional upheaval in your life and then take a long time to integrate it and think about it. It's basically, in the best sense of the word, a religious activity. And, it's and the intellect or whatever it is that lies behind it is very sensitive to your needs and your limits. And unless you approach it with a cavalier attitude, it will usually be very gentle with you. Now this fear of death thing, though, is a hard thing to come to terms with because, um, you know, it's, we are going to die. It's scripted into the human experience. Culturally, there's a great deal of anxiety around this. 
And basically, I think what one has to do is simply ride it out in terms of advice as to what you do once you have are, are in the middle of an unpleasant revelation. Um, you can sing your way through that. You can smoke cannabis to, to shake up the pieces on the board. Uh, or, and you can just wait and put up with it. it the, the real issue you see around fear on psychedelics is a surrender issue. The ego plays a trick on you because the ego begins to dissolve under the influence of the psychedelic and uh, the ego sends you the message you are dying. <laughs> this is its last most desperate ploy to halt <laughs> what is happening because the ego is dying and to the degree that you identify with the ego you'll be driven into a state of panic. That joke about the Lone Ranger and Tonto are surrounded by Indians and the Lone Ranger says, well, it looks like the end of the trail, partner. And Tonto says, uh, or he says, it looks like the end of the trail for us, partner. And Tonto says, what mean us, pale face? <laughs> A point and wish it luck and it is in fact dissolved. Um, and you can sing. It will respond to being sung to. I am always, I am terrified of psychedelics. I never take them without a sense of sickening dread pervading me. Because I figure, you know, I stand up in front of people and preach this stuff, and if it wants to get me, it will really get me good. And what I say to it when I take it, I say, I, I am surrendering, I am surrendering myself to you completely. Do what you will with me. Please don't hurt me. And if you must kill me, please do it quickly. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I know people who have tried to order it around. Heavy male dominator types who want to beat information out of it. And, my God, they have bad trips so terrifying that they never come back to it again because if it decides to turn on you, it has resources that would make your head stand on end. So he who does it gently, reverently, and with a great deal of attention. I have been watching those. I have been watching those. Getting to me press, sealed, um, seven years ago on my birthday. I still have them. Were they, were they still being good? Did you keep them in a dark, cold place? Uh, for two years, and then I moved on to a boat, and so but they're in a dark place. Well, okay. the way to tell is if they are still, if the seal was so good that they are still cracker dry, as dry as a fresh salting cracker, they're probably all right. But what tends to happen with mushrooms under the best sealing conditions is they resorb water and if it's rubbery at all or even bendable then it's probably degraded and it's not any good anymore another thing let me say before I leave this if you're really serious about taking this into your life and you really want insurance mm -hmm. against uh, unpleasant experiences then learn to grow them this catapults you into a whole different category of relationship to it because it gives special privileges to growers. It's like premier class on United Airlines or something. You get to board first and you get a wider seat and a better meal and a good movie. So, uh, and if you can grow it, it will teach you the qualities that you must have to take it, which are attention to detail, sensitivity to incremental changes, uh, scheduling, cleanliness, so forth and so on, and will reform your character sufficiently that you can then probably take it without fear. Yes, this lady over here. To my children about this? 
I have an 11-year-old daughter and a 14-year-old son. I talk to them exactly the way I talk to you about it. I say there are good drugs and bad drugs. There's no such thing as the drug problem or the drug issue. Part of the way the establishment has muddied the water is by impoverishing our language about these things. Name a drug and I'll tell you what I think about it and how you should relate to it. Uh, I've seen people destroy themselves on cocaine, heroin, alcohol. I've seen people get nutty behind tobacco, uh, religion, fascist politics, fundamentalism. Uh, and I say, you know, if you're going to take a drug, and, and if you want to take a drug, talk to me about it. If you want me to take it with you, and I think it's a, a worthwhile drug, I will. If I don't think it's a worthwhile drug, I will tell you why. But it will be a real reason, and you will find out that I'm not putting you on. And I haven't had any problem. I think we are, we infantile, not only infantile lives, not only our children, but ourselves on this issue. Some drugs are bad, some drugs are good, some drugs are trivial, and then there are styles of taking drugs. The way I think psychedelics should be taken is it's a, it's a kind of paradox. Rarely and at high doses so that you never are comfortable. I'm not peddling comfort here. I'm peddling revelation. So you must take a, what are called heroic doses. More than you want to take, that's the correct dose and less frequently than you want to take it. That's the correct timing. And then each time it will blow your mind to shreds and positively feed into the rest of your life. There is, the people who think people who take psychedelics are into escape, don't know what they're talking about. I mean, escape into what, for crying out loud? Uh, I mean, the, the heavy narcosis is going on in front of the boob tube and imbibing, you know, the daily newspaper and that kind of thing. So it's basically you've got a level with your kids, ever more so now because uh, lying has become official policy, you know? I mean, I can't believe the crap I see on television in these anti-drug ads. Uh, marijuana is the gateway drug to hard drugs. You know, tobacco and alcohol are the gateway drugs to hard drugs. Don't let anybody teach you. And so forth and so on. So it's a matter of informing ourselves and then informing our children and then teaching them how to do these things. It's a lot like sexuality. When nobody mentioned it, you learned in the gutter. And that usually meant that you got your girlfriend pregnant at age 19 and had a shotgun marriage and lived a life of agony and repression in the service of phony social values from that point on. We have to educate ourselves. Our sexuality, our psychedelic psychology, all the rest of it. We, have, we you and I, not our children, have been tremendously infantilized by... Uh, our government. I mean, think about the just say no slogan. What that means is don't think about it. Don't inform yourself. Uh, just say no. Behave, in other words, like an idiot. Uh, this, this is not serviceable. And, uh, pardon me? Yeah, why ask why? The, the empowering of institutional ignorance. It's uh, unconscionable. This is the kind of art. These people make such a strong argument for the legal uh, regulation of advertising that they would do well to step back. Or they may find themselves in a situation that they find very uncomfortable. Yeah. I mean, freedom of speech is not freedom to subvert uh, the human enterprise. Freedom of speech is uh, freedom to advocate and to argue and to respond to arguments, but not to stack the deck against 
truth and clear thinking and relative truth. You know. No, no. If if nominated, I will not run. If elected, I will not serve. <laughs> Hi, I'm I'm a recovering alcoholic and I've been sobriety psychedelic several times. And being human and not being able to keep a secret, I I told this to my sponsor in AA a couple of weeks ago, and he's going to fit. Um, let's see. I I don't feel that it's a problem or that it's taken away anything from my sobriety. If anything, it's enhanced it. But I'm having a hard time articulating to her why I don't see this as a problem. I was wondering if you could um, if you could address how to reconcile the use of psychedelics within 12-step programs. And I've heard that there are I heard it in other workshops of yours that there are people doing this, and I wonder if you. I don't want to name names, no. but the top people in AA are entirely pro-psychedelic. Mm -hmm. they, they have told me this. Uh, addiction, uh, repetitious abuse of substances has very little to do with this. Where I differ with the AA, as it's generally presented, is the idea that all things are to be looked at the same. Again, this Luddite approach where you simplify no matter how much damage it does to the complexity of the issue. A 12-step a, a program is another form of infantilization. Uh, the whole idea of addiction as disease is a way of lifting responsibility off people. After all, if heroin addiction is a disease, then it's just sort of like the flu or gonorrhea. It's something which happened to you and it's very unfortunate, but you don't need to examine your own attitudes or psychology. This is in fact what we need to do. We have to take responsibility for our action. And I think the, that the 12 step thing is way out of control at this point because there's a 12 step program for everything. I think, uh, you know, responsible activity, whether you're talking about drugs or managing your finances or your sexuality, there's no substitute for it. And you can't have a set of rules that will be sufficiently sophisticated to be a working substitute for intelligent decision making. A lot of times 12 step also has a um, diversion to it that a lot of times, you know, just, I, have, I have a friend who's also been in the program for you know, five or six years and he's so convinced of, of, of the whole thing about the Bible and the whole prophecy and everything that he's basically an alcoholic still. He hasn't come to terms with the problems yet at all. I mean, he's the same, the same person with, a, with, with only one substance less than he, had, than he had before. There's no substitute in politics, in psychedelics, in sexuality, in UFO hunting. There's no substitute for clear thinking and a reasonable knowledge of the rules of evidence. And if somebody's pushing some form of pipe at you, you need to have your crap detector out and working because there's a lot of crap out there. And some of it well-intentioned. It can be well-intentioned and still lead you down the primrose path. Chris, what do you feel about this new discovery about um, genetic AIDS controlling? Genetic, you know, gen gen genetic, genetic designing um, preventing AIDS and well, prolonging aging. You mean life extension? Yeah. I mean, it's just inevitable. Do you, what do you feel is going to happen with that? Well, so many things are happening at once. This is just part of the mix. Uh, I don't think we want to live forever. I mean, somebody said death is nature's way of making room for next year's model. And there's something to be said for that. I really think that death is what it's all about. And that uh, you know, the body is the placenta of the soul and the purpose of life in three-dimensional space is to build up this invisible organ called the soul so that it can make a, a clean flight back to its point of origin once severed from biology. 
I, I don't think we should cling, you know, to anything. Everything flows. This is, here, let me give you the one thing I've learned out of life and drugs and everything else. It's a hard truth. It's an illuminating truth. Heard correctly, it brings a smile to your lips and a tear to your eye. Nothing lasts. Nothing lasts. There are no exceptions to this. Your relationship to your lover does not last. The hatred of your enemy does not last. The wonderful home you worked so hard to create, it doesn't last. Your body doesn't last. Nothing lasts. Everything is in the process of being transformed and replaced by something else. You have to embrace that or life will disappoint you, embitter you, and tear you to pieces. I like to make an analogy to surfing. The, 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 the uninformed person thinks that when you enter the sea, you're safe near the shore. You're not safe near the shore. That's where the waves are breaking and creating the white water and the undertow. All surfers know that you have to swim out to where the waves are forming cleanly in deep water. And then you can catch the wave and ride it into the beach. But if you, if you, if you hold to the shore, you'll just be beaten to death in the incoming surf. That could be the end of the workshop as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> That's how it works. Well, because uh, science has so thoroughly convinced us that the yawning grave is the end of the story. It's, it's presented as the absolute terminus of your existence. When in fact, I believe, I think I said this last night, this is as dead as you can get. <laughs> this, you know? So the challenge is not how to face death. The challenge is how to come to terms gracefully with the prospect of eternity. The only thing that, that the only exception to nothing ever lasts is maybe the spirit itself. Maybe that's the only thing that is eternal. But it is constantly transforming. Right, but, but on, on the deepest level of the pure spirit, that is probably something that has lead through all of time, you know, beyond time. Maybe that's well, it's outside of time. Know. Yes, you can exit time. And then you exist in, in, in eternity, yeah. Reincarnation. Um, again, the evidence is inconclusive. Uh, there is some evidence, you know, stories, we all know them. But the idea that it happens to everyone seems an unnecessary hypothesis based on the idea that it happened to some people. Uh, I would like to think that we move on. I would like to think that uh, there is a kind of ascent through existence. I'm open to the possibility of reincarnation, but again, underwhelmed by the evidence. See, maybe I should say a little bit about my, my own psychology, because I always get into these wrangles with people. I'm sort of presented as a person on the fringe of the new age or something like that. I don't consider myself a new ager at all. I got where I am through doubt, skepticism, uh, lack of belief, hard-headed reason. And I've gotten, I believe, further into weirdness than the channelers, the people who are talking to the UFOs, and all the rest of them. They're such pushovers. I mean, the first uh, voice that comes along from the invisible world, and they're ready to sign on to whatever gibberish is being pushed. I think you can be a rationalist. I think you can demand hard evidence. And, and still, this will not push magic out of your world. Real magic 
doesn't demand dewy-eyed believers offering sacrifice at its altar. De real magic is real. It exists for skeptics, not believers. So the, the technique is not to believe, is to, not to stay in your comfortable cultural situation and believe the first weird rap that comes down the pipe or the second or the third. The way to do it is to be hard-headed, rational, demanding, but explore edges. Push the edges. Within, and also within the world. So if you hear that someone in India can raise the dead, fly to India. Put yourself in front of them and say, would you please raise the dead? And if they say, oh, I only do it on Tuesday, or come back in April, or you're not ready, then you just put them in the fraud column. <laughs> and, 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 and this has always worked for me. I just say, you know, you say you've got the whammy. What can you show me? I went to India. To, I mean, don't get me started. <laughs> uh, it is, it is a, 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 a spiritual uh, bargain basement of the sleaziest sort. I went to South America with the same question. What can you show me? And the guy said, well, let's sharpen our machetes and we'll go out here a half a mile into the forest and we'll cut some of this vine and we'll bring it back and brew it up and I'll show you what I can show you. None of this kiss my feet, sweep up around the ashram ten years, memorize 50,000 lines of the Avakatamka Sutra or that kind of malarkey. If there's any assumption of hierarchy, head for the door. If somebody's telling you that you're little and they're up, head for the door. It's a con of some sort. It's just, it's a horrible, horrible con. The real, the real stuff is available to those who ask for it. You don't have to prove yourself. Asking is sufficient. And none of these scams can compete with psychedelics. That's why they inveigh against it so furiously and tell you that it'll rend holes in your aura and all the rest of the malarkey that is brought against it. I mean, give me a break. So the, the thing to do is explore edges, push hard, and then use your ordinary good sense to tell shifts from Shinola, and you will move much faster than the people who are worshipping at the feet of this or that beady-eyed weasel who set himself up with a non-profit foundation and a line of bunk that's being published by the devoted slaves and peddled in airports or whatever. I mean, that's just horrible, all that stuff, horrible. In response to something that was said earlier, uh, I've been fascinated with psychedelics since my first experience when I was 17 and I, you know, have struggled with finding out about the mechanics of painting and growing mushrooms and over the last couple of years I've finally met with some, uh, with relative success and I'd just like to offer if there's anybody who sincerely, you know, has, I mean, it's a frustrating process when you first start. If there's anybody that, you know, is seriously interested, I'd be glad to give them a little help. This is an incredibly generous offer. It's very hard to learn to grow mushrooms unless someone shows you how. My book that I wrote with my brother is the best we could do, but it's like reading the instructions for putting together an electric train or something, you know. If somebody will just show you, it becomes transparent. So nobody has ever said this at any workshop I've ever been. If you're interested, do not let this gentleman slip through your There's fingers. There's a book that's available. Uh, I'm trying to think of the guy's name. Anything with Paul Stamus? The the yeah, the title of it's The Mushroom Cultivator. By Paul Stamus. But even at that, there's no substitute for somebody at your elbow showing you uh, how to do it. Thank you for twisting me off the anti-guru tirade. Uh. <laughs> Have you ever met any of the fellows from the company here from the tradition? 
Respect? Well, I make a differentiation. I'm not saying that the Hindu tradition or the yogic tradition is is phony. I'm saying that uh, we misconstrue its intent. What these traditional teachings deliver, if they are working right, is they deliver wisdom about how to live. That's what a great guru can teach you. And I don't, and that's not what I'm trying to teach you. We're talking here about using psychedelics to blow ourselves into another dimension. Uh, we need, this goes to the question hours ago about the role of psychedelics in the spiritual program of advancement. I don't claim that you will become a spiritually advanced person. I don't know what a spiritually advanced person is. What I claim is that you will contact an in, a, a dimension of experience inaccessible by any other means if you will pursue this. And then you may decide that that's fine. You verify that everything I said is true or true enough. And now you don't ever want to do that again and go on with your life. Or you may be able to make some good of it. Uh, it is not it is no substitute for ethical activity or moral sensitivity. It is no substitute for moral sensitivity. Moral sensitivity, you don't cultivate in silent darkness in your bedroom with the telephone unplugged. Moral sensitivity is visit the sick and imprisoned, heal the sick, bury the dead, instruct the ignorant. That's what moral sensitivity is about. And people don't want to hear that. They want to go off and worship at the feet of some guru. What could that possibly have to do with moral advancement? Moral advancement is care for your fellow human beings, for crying out loud. It's far more Mother Teresa than Ramana Maharshi, as far as I'm concerned. Not to knock Ramana Maharshi, but, you know... You know, in the whole, you get this in the fascination with shamanism in the New Age. Shamanism in the Aboriginal context is primarily about curing the sick. That's what it's about. Not these wild, grandiose, technicolor scenarios. My God, you can read 14,000 pages of Carlos Castaneda and nobody ever cures anybody of anything. It's all happening in this other... Uh, dimension. So it all comes down to pretty, pretty nitty gritty hands on here and now stuff. Yes. Um, I noticed that after a hallucinogenic activity and you're by yourself or you're seeing your in nature, a sort of uh, empathetic consciousness happens to where you're more in tune with the surroundings, the animals, and the plants, as though they could enter into speak to your consciousness and you can sort of with them. I wonder if anyone else experiences that or if it's um, derived from just being mushroom to not the other one. It seems like a more organic, like like a meshing of information that's coherent in everything that exists, that's alive, that you tap into, that feeds into you also and you affect the surroundings somewhat. The animals and everything sort of are affected by your presence in being there. Well, this is what I call this re-establishing of a relationship to the Gaian mind. This is what the ego blocks us from, is, the, is this relationship to nature as though it were a kind of partner and a companion. You know, the whole problem with the modern situation, I mean, earlier I defined it as ego, Here's then a behavioral definition of it. Our problem is that we cannot feel the consequences of what we're doing. We can talk about the spread of AIDS, the ozone hole, the toxification of the ocean, but if we could emotionally connect with it and feel, we would have the political reformation we're waiting for later this evening. 
So it, it, and what you're talking about, I think, is the feeling that comes when nature is suddenly perceived to be vibrant, alive, full of an intent to communicate, and caring of humanity. Uh, women, I think, are closer to this than men, but in the context of our civilization, we're also screwed up that comparing the differences between men and women in regard to that hardly matters. We have to re-empower our emotions. We've gone way out of line in terms of, of the rational mind and have completely deadened our emotional receptors to the consequences of, of what we're doing. Yes. Um, there's a, one thing you mentioned earlier about conspiracy, conspiracy theory and not subscribing to that directly. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last. You had mentioned about conspiracy yeah. theory and not subscribing to it directly because of theory. And I can appreciate that. But I think we have to look at it in more detail and maybe from some other angle to get more out of that. Maybe the uh, terminology doesn't fit. But in the 60s, having lived through that era, we, I think, really touched on what democracy could be. It really was a different relationship between people for a short period of time. And I remember how it devolved as the 60s went on and the 70s came, and what we've all experienced to the end of the 70s into the 80s and now the 90s. I think it's been um, very dramatic change. I think that to describe that its happenstance would be folly. To say completely that the CIA, as an example, although I have no information and don't even want to have it, especially something we let it go because it didn't fit their needs completely, may not be a whole story. For example, we talked about drugs, natural, especially, um, but drugs in general, can be inhabited as time goes on by those who experience it. And let's say, for example, as a theory, that those who experience that democracy, early in the 60s were inhibited from further experiencing were disassociated from it by safe houses by whatever systems were developed such that those drugs could be inhabited in a different way over a period of time rather than resulting in democracy perhaps they result in a new world or some system of control it seems to me like there may be a philosophy rather than a democracy that's new and there may be a thought process that is guiding. And one of the reasons we see this when we look inside of these institutions like um, the Center for Disease Control, the National Institute of Health, the White House, one of the reasons we see these burning people is because those are the only people who really can fill these roles. Not because there is nothing of intelligence behind that's guiding them. And by think, well, when I say intelligence, I don't mean positive intelligence. So I feel like we have to, or it would be helpful for us to keep in touch with the idea of something going on, something guiding and counter guiding. That, um, as you said about evolution earlier, that evolution really is the uh, living for the goal. I think that there is a time for 500 years in the future, and there are people that do that. And those that may have a theocracy may see that goal and not want that. They may not want to see these the materials on this planet to flow freely between all people. Once that happens, you have whatever democracy truly is. I mean, even that would transform to a new word, a new name. So I feel if there is something going on, I feel that psychedelics do allow one to penetrate to the veils that are created. I think that's why they're detrimental. That's why they're a quote-unquote controlled substance. You know, in the medical schools and in the research field, the reason there's so much cowardice and fear is because people lose their jobs. Literally, they don't even know why they lost them. If you go to the UCLA Medical School Library and read in some of the more technical journals on synthesis and other areas related to this, you will find in the corners of the book people's notes about what their experiences were. That's the source of information. That's where it's being spread. It's the only channel open. There are people all across this nation and elsewhere trying to do things. They have no avenue, and if they step out, they're cut off. Same way as in cancer therapy, the same way as in other areas where this powerful dynamic life that we are should emerge. I think it's a theocracy behind it, something that's known, um, 
slide point to present. Well, I think there are a lot of um, groups, let's say, that aspire to control society. I just don't think anybody is succeeding. I don't think that the world we're living in is the result of anybody's conscious agenda. Uh, to take LSD, for example, and again, I always go back to Occam's razor. The simplest explanation for what happened to the psychedelic revolution in the 60s is that it self-corrupted itself. It didn't require the CIA to ruin it. When you have a situation where a, a, a graduate student in biochemistry and his roommate with a trust fund can get together and pool their money and intelligence and over a long weekend produce five or ten million hits of LSD in a small apartment, what you are going to get out of that is criminal syndicalism, pyramidal organizations for the purposes of making money. And that is clearly what destroyed LSD. I mean, I lived through it. The San Francisco Oracle and, and people like that were pleading, don't sell acid. Give it away. Give it away. As long as you give it away, it will be pure. And some people weren't interested in enlightenment. Some people wanted, you know, houses in the hills and Maseratis. So it, it is our own nature that conspires against us, not the, the dreams of the CIA. I mean, don't forget, George Bush once ran the CIA, for God's sake. That's the level of competence that that agency can get together. But why hypothesize it if there's no evidence for it? Well, people decided they wanted to make money on it. What was it primarily? Control, Control of what? Well, as you But these things were distributed in micro cultures relative to the global situation. I mean, I, I don't deny that there are people who seek to subvert the natural development of the social agenda. I just think that they, uh, it's an impossible proposition. I mean, the real conspiracies are the Catholic Church, the World Bank, the IMF. And they don't think of themselves as conspirators. They think of themselves as thousand-year-old organizations, shepherd, not in the case of the IMF, but... Say what? Well, wait, let, let Richard has the talk. So, here's what's uh, listening to this coming down tonight on Wednesday night, get the full load of conspiracy stories from Dave Emery. And I think actually there's a lot to be uh, listened to very carefully in terms of the evidence that he has gathered about this. But don't you think, Richard, that even if we could almost say, even if all these conspiracies exist, we're hearing about so many that they must be self-canceling? Well, it's coming to crisis moment in terms of the massive cover-up versus the keep uncovering this and uncovering that and they just can't keep their fingers on every part of the diet. Yeah, I think uh, running a world-controlling conspiracy must be a fairly frustrating enterprise these days. I'm getting the high sign from the papers. Uh, I, mean, okay, I, I, I just want to speak to this lady's concern about LSD. LSD was used in the 60s 
for alcoholic rehabilitation very successfully. Medical justice. And only, sure. it, you know, when the government put its pants, its thumb on LSD research was this thought. But they had tremendous success with LSD in recovering alcoholics in, in uh, straight uh, psychiatric hospitals. So there is that evidence out there. There has to be an overcoming of the institutionalized fear that is exported into the society. The news is this, the psychedelic dimension represents a new world. And, you know, we can go into it and enslave the Indians, or we can go into it and save our souls. And it's going to be guided and controlled, I think, by the informed decisions of rational individuals. And, and uh, it's up to each and every one of us to make sure that we fall into that category. This is the best kept secret on this planet. It is your birthright, as much your birthright as the sexual experience, but more easily uh, evaded, more easily distorted. And so there's a certain responsibility on each of us to try and educate and inform ourselves and then integrate it into our lives. We no more know what it's for than we know what electricity or wind is for, it can be used for all kinds of things. It can be used to uh, distort human nature or to unfold it into some kind of incredible and amazing future. These things used to be called consciousness expanding drugs. Well now suppose for a moment that that were actually true, that that's what they do. If, if, if consciousness does not loom large as a part of the human future, then what kind of future is it going to be? If these things really empower consciousness, self-reflection, boundary dissolution, and creative ideation, then we must fully explore them because we are on the brink of extinction because of a failure of creativity a failure to creatively meet the challenges that history, our own history, has created for ourselves. We have to claim our birthright. Nobody can take this away from you any more than they can take away your right to have sex or breathe air or drink water. And anybody who tells you that this is an item up for uh, social manipulation and control is somehow serving a dominator uh, agenda that diminishes and degrades every single member of the human family. Uh, it is a true mystery. It's a doorway out of the dead end of Western history. It's the return path backward to the shamanic paradise that existed before history. If you don't believe what I'm saying, do the rational thing. Check it out. Thank you very much.